<laughs> We're never happy. <laughs> All right, we'll call the meeting to order. Mr. Is <coughs> there any corrections or additions to the agenda? Mr. Chairman, two action items to, to add. 21A is a social worker family facilitator appointment. 21B is a deputy assessor appointment. We can address with HR at 1050 after number 19. And one uh, correspondence item, C5 is information on the AMC Fall Policy Conference uh, that we can review with the correspondence items. Okay, is there any reports from the commissioners? <coughs> Mr. Chair, I have a South Central EMS meeting and Region 5 Emergency Management meeting. That's it. Just a PAC meeting report. Okay. South Country Health Lines. Okay, and I've got PAC and you know, there's an insurance committee meeting also. Area 2 RCRCA and uh, park meeting last evening. Okay, if there's nothing else, that'll be our agenda for today. We have the minutes of July 24th. Move them. Second. Motion is second. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, number two, Mr. Hoffman. Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Good morning. Chair, just bringing forward the joint powers agreement for the drug task force. Mm -hmm. uh, I did send it to Tony Attorney Chuck Hansen. He reviewed it. A number of entities have uh, already approved this. Mm -hmm. The changes, there's some changes to this from other years. Yep, the highlighted, the highlighted, the highlighted parts. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I think it was primarily some of the insurance indemnification language that's been rewritten. Yeah, that's right. Our legal counsel worked me to rewrote that. And what, what was actually done? You know, I mean, how, I, I think they had to separate uh, between the drug task force and uh, here you make a two sides. Uh, okay. This is something we sign every year. No, it's not every it year. It's, it, it's an ongoing JPA unless there are some amendments. Right. Okay. Okay. A second, is there any, <coughs> any other discussion? Any other discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Mr. Chair, you'll get a signed form then and give it to me. We've got it oh. ready to sign after the right. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank Have you. Have a good day. Thank See ya. Thanks, Rachel. Last June. She left. Um, I assume she's coming right back. <clears throat> Mr. Chair? Yes. But good. I know we approved the minutes here already, and I went past I didn't catch. I had made a comment on one part here. Um, <clears throat> it was on page six electronically, but it was uh, that uh, the auditor or the um, auditor treasurer uh, from Staples was going to buy uh, cabinet doors. I just wanted to clarify, was it cabinet doors or cabinet locks that we were? It was the doors. It was the doors themselves. Doors with okay. locks. All right. Can be locked. Thank you. And a follow-up to that, we did get a documentation that it meets the state requirements from the uh, procurement. Okay. Cooperative procurement venture, which is a state bid process. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. You're, you're Sorry, right. I just noticed I didn't have the claim. <coughs> like, whoa, wait a minute, guys. Um, all right, I hope that you have a claims list for $246,890.57. We 
Is that the right one? Services servicing the vehicles, um, picking where to go. I know we try and patronize many I, different places. Okay. I guess that would be the department heads' uh, All right. okay. choice. Um, I don't have know if we have a policy. What they do you know, I don't know. Because I saw one that looked kind of high. I was curious about it. Oh. All right. <laughs> I'll move on. Second. Okay, we have a motion a second on the claims. Any other discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. And on the signature um, sheet is going to be on its way. <laughs> so we're just a little bit behind on that. Okay. Um, the second item that I had was um, establishing the canvas board for the 2018 election. We need one for both the primary and the general election. We go over the um, final results. Um, the statute outlines who has to be a part of that canvas board. Uh, we need two commissioners and um, the district court, the court administrator, the mayor of Nuong, and two members of the county board along with myself. And for this election, Commissioner Simmonson would be ineligible because his name is on the ballot. So whoever you appoint is, um, who will be notified the date of the meeting is already established, August 17th at 10 a.m. is the um, one for the primary. Mr. Chair, there is a conflict on um, community health board, uh, full board meeting on August 17th at 9 o'clock versus 10 o'clock. <coughs> so that'll have to be addressed for that person will not be able to attend that meeting. <clears throat> Are there multiple commissioners that go to that meeting? All of us. All you do. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that a short, that's a short meeting, I'm assuming, right? It is very short. So that's the one, that's the meeting we've rescheduled. Once yeah, more. correct. Should I switch this to, I could see maybe 845? You know, before that would be that would be better. Would that work ahead I think of that time? Would, or eight thirty, or I don't know. Eight thirty. Yeah, eight thirty would be perfect, probably. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Should be a short, quick um, meeting. I will check with um, the court administrator and um, the mayor. I would notify them of this, but <coughs> I'll see if we can get an eight thirty time. Okay. And we'll assume that it's right. Unless you hear something different. So we're assuming 30 unless we hear differently over here. Yes, please. <clears throat> okay, so we need two commissioners for mm -hmm. each. Well, I'll, I'm here. Um, it's not a, uh, there's no per diem paid on that. I, I, I will volunteer to um, do both of them if, unless somebody's got to. We got to have two of us, so I think, right? Yep, so we need one more. I, I volunteer. Okay. So it's 8.30 on the. 17th. And please mark down the November 13th date as well. They would both be um, assigned here at this meeting. November 13th at what time? 8.15. And it's right here? We generally have met in here. Do we need backup person? Or do you have to have these specific people by request? No, I just, I need two commissioners. Okay, I'm just wondering if, if you, sometimes we, if something happens, someone can't make it, do you want a backup person to do it? If they can't make it, can they, they can call somebody else? And, yeah, for sure. Okay. I know on both those days, I'm actually in the wall, but that, that morning anyway, so that would be Do you want to come in? Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I think it's a minimum, so if you wanted to be here, I don't think it's going to hurt anything. Yeah, no. yep. Or do you want to do it? In no, that's place? fine. I just said if you if you something comes up, you guys can't do it. Um, right now, the schedule looks like I'm in I'm home for meetings a little bit later that morning, so I can come in a little earlier. Somebody gets us 
conflict. Do you need a motion on this? Um, so. I would think that it went to the. I would move to appoint uh, Commissioner Winter or Commissioner Walker. Okay. I'll second. And, and the dates on, this one, on that motion? Okay. Any other discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Andrew. Number five. Okay. Um, list of drainage repairs. Um, we do include the aerial spraying in this one. Um, and everything else is a fairly uh, normal re <coughs> repair. Does he have any questions? Aerial spraying is this. We did what about half? Roughly, yeah. Uh, is that does that compare to about half of what aerial frame bill was last year then? Okay. I don't remember, yeah. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Okay. Sure. I had somebody yes. contact me about concerns when they're uh, repairing, uh, that they're replacing they could say they're repairing concrete or something and that's a smooth flowing thing. Coefficients are that they're replacing it with only corrugated and not aligned. <coughs> so basically, you're slowing the water down because an eight-inch corrugated is less flow than a than the aligned one. You know, you know those things do. So do you know? Are they? You know, if they're replacing eight-inch, are they just putting in the, the standard corrugated, or are they putting in aligned? It depends on kind of soil conditions. Most of the time, it's <coughs> just a. Uh, a plastic corrugated. The standard corrugated. Yeah, not aligned. Yeah, okay. we match the size. Of the concern was that you're creating yeah. a little bit of a slowdown there. Sure. Okay. Just to um, let you know. Yep. And in like some cases too, you know, if it's a like a seven inch or something like that, they don't make that anymore. So right. Go up to an eight. Right. There. Yeah. But there's thirty or thirty or forty percent difference in the flow of, between the two, isn't there? I, it's quite a bit. It's quite a bit. I don't know if it's that much. But. Yeah. Okay, that's all. Question for you, Andrew. When I look at the acres for the each ditch system that was sprayed, um, Judicial Ditch 30 is at 16 acres. Judicial Ditch 29 is at 32. And I'm thinking that Judicial Ditch 30 is as big as 29 or bigger. Based on spot spraying, so they're not. They're this not is an entire. They're they're going through and turning on and off or spot spraying okay. as they see it from the air. <laughs> they can do that at that speed. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's what they say. Okay. And so we pay the acre by the application rate. Okay. So there isn't anybody measuring any acres. Just yeah. Based so on much an acre yeah. of material. Mm -hmm. Do they use that by? I know they know how much they spray per acre, so is it by volume of water they spray it in, or actually trying to get an estimate on what they fly over? Is there by volume they spray. Okay, that's my understanding. Okay, I did not know that, so thank you. And the ground, <coughs> the ground spray should be the same way. Are we getting that bill yet? Sure. I haven't got it. Yeah. Got it yet. Have got no. they done? They finished up, so probably the next meeting, yeah. if we get that, I'll bring that forward to them. It, it would be nice on that ground spring to be able to have documentation <coughs> of how well it worked. I'm, I'm assuming it would work better, so we just yeah. Yeah. I would yeah. like to have a visual yeah. of that. Notice some yeah. Yeah. systems that are all in the kind of spot checking in that there's some good. Oh, okay. A lot of the weeds and trees do. Yeah. So you said you really saw them get the trees good. Yeah. Might as well. What are they using for herbs? Oh, yeah. Because uh, uh, 240 variety something. And uh, okay. we have Tordon in there, a remedy or something like that? I don't think there is on this. On the aerial one, there's not. Okay. It's just Tordon. I don't know if they can use Tordon sure. over water. Oh, yeah, aqua, blade ball. Yeah, yeah. And there's something else for the tree 
used to, but I can't remember offhand what that name was. Okay. Well, I'm sure that the ground will do a better, if they're using some, something specific, killing trees, that will do a better job on tr trees and, yeah. and some of the large there's shrubbery that's growing out there that we're not killing eventually. Get a lot more on there. Yeah, Focus can, on it. You can see it better when they're driving along the edge than when they're flying above it. Yeah. Yep. And don't most of the trees <coughs> and uh, shrubbery type things uh, grow toward the top part of the ditch bank anyway? Yeah. Yeah. my experience. Yeah, the three quarters ish, I suppose. I yeah. think. Is it pot? Uh, and I don't know if I get time to do it, but I. I'll talk to you about maybe we, like we've got a ditch or two out on the west end of the county that are done. One done that was grown and, and some aerial, so I can maybe take a, a little look at them and see how my visual observation is. Yeah. It's, uh, just curious to see personally how they the two work. You know, give them a couple more weeks and see what happens. We've got a map of the county. That shows the ones that are aerial and the ones that are brown. We can get that to you. That would be, I think, that'd be very really good. good. You can just look yourself. <coughs> and it's pretty much the ones that don't have both the buffer or aerial, and then the ones with the acquired or ground speed. Yeah. I think that'd be appreciated. It'd also help us if we get, talk, uh, we get uh, people to talk, ask questions, or have comments so we can look to see which way they were sprayed. Yeah. Thank you. I'll move the repairs. Second. Okay, we have a motion to second. Any other discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, okay, six is just a monthly update. Stop, stop this if you have any questions. Uh, the 2018 purchasing projects, the contractor is going to be moving in the, the plant in this week. Thought he could start Wednesday or Thursday. We're going to start on number 11 since we had some issues with that project and get that uh, strong, a little bit stronger because a lot of the material is going to haul down that road and go 20, 6, 13. Is, is that the one that's got potholes that I've been getting called about? Um, that might be 20. They did that. by Hanska. Yeah, they were 20 and 13 meet just west of Hanska. And they did their milling. So they're ready to pave, and then they haven't been back for a few weeks. And so it's. I got a person that's down that end of the county who's been called me several times. We called and I think they've called Andrew, I believe, too. Yeah. Right. Yep. We called the contractor. They came in and did some work to try to get it to pass the vault until they get here. And get that at least the first lift in. Yeah, the individual that called me was concerned about the size of the hole and the safety. But it is a closed road. I understand. I still didn't make any difference to him. He said he called me, called me once and I was going to talk to you about today and then he called me again since then. Okay, any other questions on that? The municipal project in Springfield was supposed to start today. They did. Okay. <laughs> That's good. I went by that quarter this morning. They were tearing curb out. Yeah, they're going to do a lot of removals and adjust that catch basin on 14, Highway 14, and then start pouring concrete. Then Thursday is the gray, so. Okay. So that should go fast, and then the plan is next week to do milling and overlay. And so that project should be done fairly quick. So we'll they get, get the, the construction part done, that the rest of it will. It's going to take a few days probably, right? Are they going to do the overlay quickly after they do the billing or what? Yeah, we've got it in there that they have to do it within five days. But it sounds like they're going to mill one day and pave the next day or two after that. Okay. So it should be like a day to mill everything and a day or two to pay everything. So it'll take a little bit longer on five just because we're increasing that grade by the railroad tracks to smooth that hump out. So there's multiple lifts. So yeah, they're raising it almost a foot there. Wait, wait for lifts to cool. I know. I, I knew they were doing quite a good, you were going to be doing a little excavation because there's 
more red lines on that piece of pavement there than there. It's almost more red than there is down wet red. <laughs> and, and I do have a question, and, and um, going a little further out on 16, who's responsible for the railroad crossings? They are. Okay. I don't know if you've observed the what guys, that railroad crossing looks like. The guys keep telling us that it's in tough shape. I went out, I, I crossed it with a truck, and coming around that corner, it really is rough because it's not our road that's bad, but it's the concrete that's in between the rails is really breaking up. Uh, I'll get some pretty good chunks missing. Yeah. If you remember, I don't know if anybody was on the board then, but a number of years ago, the county had projects that put in concrete panels and a number of railroad crossings. Mm -hmm. And that we'll probably have to see if we can't do that there. That is, that's concrete already though. Yeah, it's just it's bailing concrete. I don't know how long it's been there. The state put that in a while back before we took it over. So, but they, you know, they use a lot more salt than we do, so that's hard on concrete. I couldn't tell you, but from what I saw, the corners are breaking off. Yep, that's the what I panels. And so they probably need to be replaced, which is not cheap, but. I know in driving over it, they are, the, the, the pieces missing, and there's enough of it that it's really rough, and it's particularly on a, on a corner with a lot of trucks making that corner. Uh, I consider it starting to get to be a safe, a little bit of a safety hazard because trucks come around that corner. It's a, it's a difficult corner to mark to make anyway because it's coming back on the angle, and you're meeting traffic on that. Uh, so I, I was pretty sure you were aware of it, but I wanted to make sure you you understood so we didn't have a, a surprise problem. Yeah, that that's a deal where we can't just hire a contractor and do it. We have to. The specific contractors that the railroad allows, and you have to work with the railroad, and but we pay for it. Okay, thank you. And that would be state aid funds. Yep. Then uh, the Prairieville Bridge uh, started July 30th. They were laying, started laying pipe yesterday. I'm thinking they should finish laying pipe today if they can get it all delivered. So by the end of the week, that project is going to be close to done. Then after that contractor gets done with that, he's going to move <coughs> on and start working on the Conner Road 20 bridge. And that would take another week or two and then that'll be done. So we're making progress there. At the roundabout, they've got all the, or after today, they should have all the pipe in the ground. And they've got to do some final shaping for the grading. And they're bringing in their gravel base and then they're talking about starting concrete here a week or two for where we are. So that's making progress too. And Once you have someone on completion on that? Completion is supposed to be October 2nd. So it's a couple months yet. Yep. There's a lot of work yet to do with concrete and black top and the, the living snow fence and all the seating and stuff. Wayne, on the, on the trees there, that I know they were going to plant that. Does that remain the state's property, the, the tree line? That's what the county board agreed to maintain. Yeah, so it remains state property and then we maintain it. Is that correct? Yep, it's still state right away. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. The only thing that might hold that up is the uh, white standards. When we did the pre construction meeting, they said there's a difficult time getting the poles, white poles. So there's a possibility come early October everything will be done but the lighting. And they talked about doing some temporary lighting so they could open it up. So that's that's out there. Then uh, Andrew, do you have anything else on the ditches? Um, we had quite a few calls again now for fall fall work. Um, like I said, the ground spring is done and I want to get the invoice for bringing that to the board for approval. Um, talk with the cedar for the buffer strips. He is up in Civic County right now, finishing up. Um, so it should be a week or two, he'll be down here. Uh, we do have our maintenance guys um, running with the, 
the more knocking down the weeds. Um, so then when he comes in, he can till it and disc it and get a good seed bed. It's um, the bat more, so it chews it up better. It's a 15 foot wide. You just make one pass. The timing should be, usually they say seeding in early October is a good time. It's the optimal time to seed grass. In August. So we should be. Yep, so it should be end of August. I would think we'd be in seeding. Okay. And then we quit raining. Yeah. <laughs> um, so other than that, just getting calls and waiting uh, till fall work again. Got a pretty good list of projects already. Yeah, for the fall. And then for future projects, uh, I talked with the Renville County engineer and about the uh, design engineer and the historian that the board approved at the last meeting. And he, I s sent a copy of the contract agreement, and so he was going to bring that to their board today to see what they would be willing to contribute, if any. So we should have an answer for you for that. Mr. Enter, did we? It's probably time that we get a commitment from Renville County, and I don't know if you've had time to talk to their administrator or have any communication with them. They have a new person there, but I, okay. Can, okay. I have not contacted that okay. person yet. I think we need to get we'll check. something that's, we know where we're going going forward on that bridge. Okay, I will, um, first I contact her from Renton County, Bob Fox, He's him and I have worked with him through the energy force. So I will also give him a call and uh, get a, contact in a couple different little spots. Yeah. That'd be good. Anyway, and I assume if anybody else owns any of the other commissioners, it's not a bad thing to reach out and, and uh, you know, keep them in mind and keep them up to date what's going on and encourage them to because Renville the County and I assume when Bob talked to me about this he was speaking for the county that they were they want this was important to them and they would be willing to participate. So Reminding them of that. Okay. All right, and then uh, moving on to maintenance. We completed our seal coating, uh, 35 miles on July 31st. Most of the seal coating was done in July. Uh, worked out pretty well again this year. It seems to be holding up nice. Um, we're going to be doing some patching now once the contractor moves in. We'll have that 3,000 ton of mix that we're going to put down patch on a road that needs to get us through so we can do a project on it. We started a second round of top cuts for mowing and we'll start mowing the weeds now if we see them. And we, we've been able to spray about 106 miles of road. Now if you compare last fall and this summer what we've done, there's 68 miles that we haven't done yet but we're still working on trying to get through. And then uh, once we get that 68 miles done, we're gonna start checking over last falls again. Let's see if we can do that second time. And blading roads is ongoing. And we've hauled most of the gravel we need to, but we do have a number of roads we want to put some shouldering on. So there's still plenty to do this fall. And then uh, we'll see us out there doing some mastic work on the, it looks like we're going to do County Road 12 and, and 29 west of 4. If you drive those roads, you, you see the cracks as you drive across, you hear a thump every time you cross them. The mastic should help fill that in and make it a little smoother, and make those roads last longer. It's a little more expensive than regular crack sealing, but the regular crack sealing isn't strong enough to hold up to the bigger cracks that are breaking down. The um, seal coating, I know the last time we uh, met it was in the rain and we had a bunch of oil out there and didn't know how did that all turn out. Are we seal coated up to where we need to be and yeah. what happened in that instance? He got the third one canceled in time and the second one, they had a break, enough break in the weather that they got it down. So it worked out okay. So we got everything seal coated? Yep. Everything we planned on. <coughs> 
section of was it 24 where they had, I had driven over that road a couple of times and uh, it was between put some on and then it rained and then you didn't you came back finish later but driving on the road one side is done and the other side wasn't and some of the approaches I can see you've been working on that one and not been able to get finished because of the weather but it all looks good now I mean I, I've been back since and I can't tell the difference between which side was done and which one wasn't. Well, they work it out so that they work on a road, they get the, first they get one load in, and they get the driveways done ahead of time because you can't do the driveways afterwards or you're scuffing up and scarring up the road you, you do. So usually they get one load in and they do driveways ahead and then they finish out that load so we don't have to pay the marriage because we can only hold the truck for a couple hours. Then uh, the next time, they get maybe two loads, and they do the roads that they've got the driveways done already, but then they hold back one distributor load, and they do driveways on the next road. And so they work themselves ahead that way. And so sometimes they get far enough ahead they can get three loads done in a day, as long as they don't have to mess with driveways. So they get a lot of miles done that way. But if they run out just right, they might have one lane done and another lane not. So then. The and it might rain the next day, so it might be that way for a few days, but we have signs up that say no center line and do not pass, pass with care, so liability-wise, we're covered. It was just an unusual situation this year to see that happen. Well, that, you drive happens. on the road one side, you got fresh grit on the other side, you don't, and, uh, and the driveways are done, and they, I mean, it's just, it's interesting to see the, how the procedure went. It, it happens every year, you just got fortunate to rain like this. They've got the, the guys know what they're doing. They got that system down pretty good. And uh, normally we, in the past, we've only done like 27 miles. We're trying to ramp up so we can get more seal coating done. We've been getting behind on the second seals. So next year we, we got in the budget to do 45 or six miles. So we're going to try to average somewhere in the mid 30s now here for the next five years or so. I think it's important. I think that uh, that helps. Uh, a lot to hold that road together. Yeah. It holds the highway together, the road surface together longer, and yeah. costs us less in the end. And we think with the extra mon money that's been put on surfaces, there's less patching, so we can cut back on the patching dollars, throw that into the seal coating. I think we're eventually getting ahead here, and good. it's a good deal. I'll move to accept more file. Second. Okay, a motion to second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. last night. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for inviting me, Carrie Nesky with Area 2 and also um, RCRC and Marshall. Don't recall which one you have first on your agenda for updates at Area 2 or RCRC. Well, let's start with Area 2. Um, I did provide a little three-page handout. As you'll see from a little sticker on the front, we are celebrating our 40th anniversary. Area 2 has been around since 1978, believe it or not. Um, even more surprising, I've been there for 25 years myself. So it's making me feel really old. <laughs> <It's been normal. laughs> um, starting at the top of the page on, on, for Area 2, we're looking at the last fiscal year, so I'm basically looking July 1st of last year through June 30th of this year. We've, we're in the same fiscal year as the state of Minnesota. Our staff is still small but sweet. Myself as executive director, we have an engineering intern, Joe Shepherd. He too will be there 25 years as of October. He's kind of my work husband, we always joke. And then Dwayne Hansel, I'm sure everybody knows him through Boltman Mank. He is still 90% um, retired from Boltman Mank, but works one day a week for Area 2. And so we enjoy having, having him on staff as well. Uh, the project accomplishments, we'll skip, as I've got that as a separate page. As far as ongoing uh, projects, normally I've got a page half a sheet long. This year's a little different story. We uh, think we've been working on these three projects for about three months. 
happily, we, the first two are done. The Nordland Six Road Retention in Lane County and uh, Great Stabilization in Murray County finished up last week. Um, Red River Falls 18, that was actually built last fall, but there's a little bit of repair work after the floods that we had in July. Um, so the contract will come back before we release that 5% retainer. And then lastly, we're actually working outside of our boundary on a project in Renville County. It's just on the north side of the city of Morton up on the hill. And it's a, a existing dam that had washed out from, I don't even recall which year, but they had some severe flooding out there and so it had washed the pipe out. And they had received disaster relief funds to do that, but they didn't have any engineering services. So they had asked kind of special permission for area two and we said, sure, we had time. So we're in the uh, process of rebuilding that one. Uh, that one is just about done as well. So we're making headway now that the rains are kind of starting to slow down. As far as Brown County projects, um, we are working with the Swell and Water District pretty closely. Uh, there's a potential grade stabilization or dam in Leavenworth Township, Section 11, that we're working with. Uh, lots of trees, lots of habitat. So it's, gonna, it's not going to be an easy one, but not to say it can't be done. And then there's also a lot of small dam repairs that we've worked with the soil and water staff on. Um, basically contacting those landowners, letting them know that there's 75% cost share available if they'd like to rehabilitate those dams. Uh, those dams mostly have the corrugated metal pipes were built in the 60s and 70s and they're pretty much nearing the end of their lives. We come in, um, fairly inexpensive repair, normally anywhere between twenty dollars to $30,000 but we replace that with concrete pipe. So we know that that pipe will be there long past our lifetimes and uh, works usually works out really well that the landowners are um, interested in that. Moving on to legislative and financial information. Um, our biennial appropriation that we received from the state of Minnesota, we're in the second year of that appropriation and that's $140,000 a year. In addition, the nine member counties provide $87,000 for the administration of our Joint Powers Board. That has stayed the same, that 87,000 for many years. We haven't raised that, so it's, we've been real cost effective in keeping our admin expenses down. Um, legislatively, we did receive 700,000 in bonding this session. We did ask for a million, but of course there were concessions made all around. We did receive 700,000, which is great. Um, funds should become available roughly October 1st. Um, we've got a, a lineup of projects ready to encumber those funds too, so we'll be busy with that. And then lastly, last December, we renewed the Joint Powers Agreement. We do a two-year agreement, just in case anything would come up in the meantime. So um, all other terms and conditions are unchanged, just a new ending date of December 31st of 2019. For project funding, uh, we have a little bit of bonding left from our uh, previous uh, appropriation of a million dollars. There's roughly $32,000 left. Majority of that is going to cover a lot of the engineering expenses that we have on, on projects. That's an eligible expense. And so we usually claim that at the end once we get as much construction done as possible. And then I do have the new appropriation of 700,000 down. As far as the levy that we request from Brown County, that too has been unchanged for quite a few years now. Um, $12,971, and we collect that at the end of our fiscal year, so this would not be due to Area 2 until next June. And then lastly on that first page is just a reminder, we always have a legislative gathering jointly <coughs> with um, RCRCA, and that is going to be Thursday, November 1st in Redwood Falls. Um, I believe there is an AMC regional meeting. I don't, don't know if Brown County is impacted by that, but the rest no. of the counties are. That's, that would be the more than the southwest part of the state. Yeah, and that meeting, I believe, is in Jackson that morning, and so we're doing it in the afternoon, um, in Redwood Falls that afternoon, and then we'll have a, an evening meal to go along with that. Any questions on page one? Now, let's flip to page two. Uh, this is just a list of our completed projects for our last fiscal year, again, July 1st through June 30th. Um, you'll see there was a number, I don't know exactly how many projects there were, but a number of them, majority of them were in uh, Lyon, Redwood, Lincoln, and Murray counties. And the little box down on the bottom right hand side is, it pretty much tells the story. It just shows you how much was bonding, how much was federal, local, um, county funds, landowner funds. And as you can see, we're 
we're extending. If we didn't have all that other cost share funds to help our funds go further, we're also doing the same with um, a lot of the federal funds. They can't pay for an entire project, but when they combine it with our funding, we can get a lot more done together. So it's a very good year, um, about $778,000 worth of projects on the ground. For pictures, um, at the bottom of that page, there is a link to our website, and there's a lot of before and after photos, if you want to see those. And just a reminder for the for the, this board that um, as you go through these projects down here, the, the projects that are in uh, Redwood, uh, Lyon, uh, anywhere to the northwest of Brown County, those would, would impact Brown County from the same point that that's where the water comes, it comes through Brown County. And so if we can slow down the water before it starts coming here, it helps us to reduce the flooding comparable to some of what we saw this summer. But Yes, we don't get the projects necessarily so much in Brown County, but that we benefit from the projects. Yeah. Yeah. When you look at the topography of the area, the retention possibilities in Redwood and Lyon are just a little bit more feasible. They're more volume for the project in those areas. When you get to Brown County, it kind of flattens out more, and so a lot of times you're impacting more uh, crop ground, and it gets it a little bit more difficult to do. But um, Dennis was completely right that we do try to keep it up higher in the watershed and then that betters it for everybody downstream. And we do have a couple of new commissioners that, uh, and I don't know if they've heard this before or not but it's something I I it was impressed by the fact that I never thought of this is, uh, our our water starts in eastern South Dakota that's where the runoff starts going down to Minnesota or the Cottonwood and Redwood down to Minnesota and Mississippi and if you take the elevation in, in New Orleans and the elevation where the water starts, Redwood Falls, I believe, is the average, is a mean elevation. So the water is running much faster from the time it gets where it starts to Redwood Falls than it is from Redwood Falls to New Orleans. So we, that's an important part of making sure that we, we do the diligence to slow the water down where it's coming at us really fast. I usually have to make that kind of comparison at the legislature too, because they always hear about all the flooding in the Red River Valley and think how terrible that is. And when I tell them about the flooding we have, I tell them it's, it's like taking a, a cup of coffee and pouring it down the top of, well, the Red River Valley is if you spill a cup of coffee on your kitchen floor, it just covers all over. That's the kind of flooding they have. Our flooding is we're standing on a childhood slide and we're pouring that same cup of coffee and it's just gaining speed and strength as it goes down. And so that tends to kind of turn the light bulb on to realize that Minnesota is that different from one, one area to the other. Mr. Chairman, a specific Brown County example would be from the Wellner Hageman Dam to New Walm, there's 370 feet in elevation change. From New Walm to New Orleans, it's 800 feet. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I have and specifically with the Wellner Hageman Dam, we were at the Park Commission meeting last night with one of the recent rains, the dam the flood control uh, level went up over 10 feet overnight with the rain, and of course the system then channels it out. Those are, those are the, that's the purpose of having uh, the dams you're talking about. That's we're trying, the purpose that I believe it's right is that we're trying to, to slow down the water by holding them back and then it can pond in these areas and then slowly be released to go through the system. I mean. Brown County was on the receiving end of the flood area in July. Uh, so we all got an opportunity to see how bad it could get. We need to continue to work toward slowing it down. The bad part, the water didn't go all the way to the, the South Dakota part of it. It started in only 50 miles west of us. And uh, so, but I think we, we need to keep working toward that. And that's very tuned to the excellent job on that. When the governor was out to um, look at the flood damages, and but when he stopped in Walnut Grove and they were hit really hard, they had gotten about 11 inches of rain within six, seven hours. And um, there was a lot of damage, a lot of roads washed out and culverts and whatnot. And um, everyone did a great job because they kept saying, it's like, you know, and this is what happened when we had flood water retentions on the ground. Can you imagine how worse it would be if we didn't have Lake Laura holding all that water back there? And there was some real impressive photos of the project working so it was I mean there were some damages don't get me wrong but when you have a storm that big which I'm sure it was well over a 500 year storm 
that you know it's common to expect those kind of damages, but um, a lot of them worked, and that's what we needed. I know I, I was actually we have a camper uh, on Shatek, and uh, we happened to be staying there that night, and it rained and it rained and it rained, and I I just didn't know if it was ever going to quit. And the next morning, I walked we walked down to the lake, and we were the you know, the water cross where you cross out of the dikes to, uh, to go out to islands in Chitek. The water was going over the first dike at that morning. The day before we had went across there, the water level was almost five feet lower. Uh, and it's now let's go back and look at it. I didn't pay much attention, but now I'm going to go back. We drive through and you look at there and you go, know, well, yeah, I could stand on the water level and I you know, have would be about the top of the road. And uh, you can see water going over. So you know how fast, how much water, and how fast it gets there. And it, so it is, it is really important to retain that water to slow it down. And I think that's a process we need to keep putting out to our legislators because that helps us to be able to survive these rain systems that happen now. Um, so um, I keep encouraging you. To, I, I believe strongly that it's a positive for for what we're doing. And I know we, I hear some people talk about we need, there's, we should take some dams out now. I don't agree with what they said there. I've, I've been hearing some people talk about taking some of these dams from back in the 50s back out again because they don't think they're working. Um, I it don't depends on the purpose and where they're at, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, like on the Cottonwood River at Lamberton and at Sanborn, there's three dams that are, are tentatively being taken out and they're going to be replaced with, you know, ripples and rock weirs. And from that perspective, I was supportive of it because they were they weren't flood control dams. Nope. They were basically built. Well, I know the one at Lamberton for sure was to form ice so that they could cut ice. You know, back in the day, um, the ones in Sanborn, I'm not sure what their purpose was. I know the one in the golf course they used for irrigation, and they, they'll still have that ability even with the rock weirs that would be replaced. So, in that perspective, I can see it. But if they're they're saying more of the flood control ones, Southwest Minnesota needs them. So, if there's proposal to remove them. I don't think I support that too much. Carrie, is there, as far as water retention, is there any new projects or new ideas? I mean, if you look at Lyon County and Lincoln County, I, I get out there quite a bit, and there's, to me, there's a lot of potential out there for water holding and water retention. Is there any new, new ideas or new projects in those areas that we see coming down the road at all, or what, what's your thoughts on that? Um, as far as more like a, in, instead of the typical, you know, using a road retention or a dam, a different type of project, we did complete one in Lincoln County last year. It was, um, I'm not sure what you want to call it. It was a county ditch system that they were looking at probably about $150,000 of repair to it. And two landowners downstream um, did the rim and the crack, and so they had wetland restorations. So what the plan decided to be was that instead of replacing all that tile, that <coughs> pumping station would be used that they would actually break that tile and get that water pumped into those wetlands that were restored. But the problem was they didn't have money for this pumping station, which turned out to be about $120,000, I would say. Area 2 was able to come in to use bonding funds to pay for that pump station in addition to all the other state funds for the, the wetland restorations. And so that's kind of a pilot project, but there's a lot of um, counties with ditches that have got the same problem, a lot of aging infrastructure, and that if they can do something similar to that where they can um, you know, kind of bypass the, the bad areas and pump it into a wetland restoration, that that's getting a lot of um, attention. Um, our intention was to do kind of tour in that area the floods kind of sidetracked that tour <laughs> this summer. <laughs> Not to say it isn't going to happen, but um, if and when we get that arranged, we'll be sure in the ground coming in. It is it's a bit of a success story. And a project like that kind of works along the same basis as what we talk about, the flood control mm -hmm. structures with dams that we put in it. The water is taken out of the process of going down the stream as fast as it can to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And it puts it in a place that holds it. We reduce the pressure on our, our Drainage systems. Um, I think it's a great idea when it can when we can make those things work. 
the, the last page of your handout is just a summary of the projects that we paid for uh, with the 2016 bonding appropriation. And you've seen the majority of this list. Um, again, the, the summary box at the bottom tells the story. It just shows you, you know, the total dollars spent um, between state, local, and federal funds, uh, federal cost share. Um, we're supposed to provide one dollar local match for every four dollars, no, excuse me, three dollars of state funds. So you can see we're better than that. We're actually putting in more local funds than what's required. But again, it's, it's making our dollars go further, and everybody's dollars go further. Any other questions for Area 2s? Okay. I'll move to uh, accept the annual report in the, uh, uh, to include uh, $12,971 in the uh, 2019 budget. I'll second that. A motion a second. Any other discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay. We'll move on to the RCRCA update. <clears throat> That's the other hat that I wear. Um, and then this is the calendar year. Um, RCRC is a little different. They do run January 1st through December 31st. Makes it kind of nice for our bookkeeping because by the time you get one done, you get an audit done, then you're ready to tackle the other one. Um, as far as the first page, as you all know, our CRCA is largely grant driven. Um, always has been and probably always will be, which, which is good. Um, you can see the list of ongoing grants that I've got listed there. The uh, majority of them are through Pollution Control Agency, uh, Department of Ag, and then we're also working on a Discovery Farm site, which is a merger between Minnesota Ag Water Resources Center and Department of Ag. One that I forgot to list on here as I was just sitting here is that um, our CRCA will also be getting a bonding appropriation. Uh, the Lake Redwood Reclamation or the dredging project was funded by um, the legislature this year. So there's 7.3 million coming down um, to do that. Um, it's not said and done. There's um, MCEA, which is Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, has questioned the legality of incorporating the LCCMR money into the bonding bill. So there has been some data requests from the state level. <clears throat> so I can't say that there isn't going to be a hiccup or two along the way, but it's appropriated and it should be coming down and we're proceeding my place. Um, I'll jump into kind of just a brief explanation of some of these grants and, and what their purposes are. Um, the first one on there is a new grant application that I'll be doing. Uh, this is for clean water funds that every year there's a new round of clean water funding. I'm going to be putting in one for Sleepy Eye Creek in the Cottonwood Watershed and Three Mile Creek in the Redwood Watershed. In the past, we've kind of focused on the really impaired watersheds, the ones we knew had problems, the, the landowners that are coming in and we've got projects ready to go. We can't get them funded um, without having a lot of the information that they want where you can prioritize the subwatershed, you target your practices, and um, you can measure your results you don't get money. It just isn't working that way. So we're shifting gears. Um, the state has got a non-point funding priority plan and the number, there's three things. One addresses groundwater, one is something else. And the first one is finding those sub watersheds that are slightly impaired or close enough to meeting water quality standards that with money and some work that they could possibly meet those standards. So that's why we've picked out Sleepy Eye Creek and um, Three Mile Creek with this most recent water quality monitoring that we've done in the last year. Those two watersheds are closest to meeting, especially the sediment. So that's what we're going to apply for, and hopefully we'll have some luck this year. And I, to me, the unusual thing about that is they're both uh, probably more egg land, flat egg land related type of drainage than anything else we can work with in the area and we keep getting pointed at is that it's a runoff is a problem and yet our cleanest water systems are the ones that they're kind of yeah. saying we shouldn't be. And I live on Sleepy Eye Creek myself, oh, 750 uh, feet from it. So yeah, yeah, Sleepy Eye Creek runs through a lot of Redwood and a lot of Brown County. Yeah. So when I heard that from our consultant, I'm like, <laughs> What's well, surprised to you? I know. After, when you mentioned that the other day, I've been thinking about that. Like, this is this makes me think differently about some of what they've been telling us. Yeah. yeah. That data is that available publicly, or who, where would working? It, it is. Um, 
On the next page, one of the grants that we've been working with is called the Surface Water Assessment Grant. And it's, there's 24, well, within the, the Redwood and the Cottonwood, there's 24 streams and nine lakes that we've been intensively monitoring May through September of last year and then also this year. And so this information is based off of last year's data. So it's real current, um, real legitimate. And um, let me get back to you before you can find it. I know on RCRC's website we have a summary of it, but also Pollution Control Agency would also have they their would own website. So it is established. Um, the bottom of page one is an ongoing grant that RCRCA has had. I, I should look up how many years it's been. I'm guessing it must be 18 to 20 years that um, they've contracted with pollution control on this. It's the Watershed Pollutant Load Monitoring Network. Um, there are seven sites within the area, um, three in the Redwood, Minnesota River at Morton, Sleepy Eye Creek by Leavenworth, the Cottonwood at Leavenworth, and then the Cottonwood here in New Ulm that get uh, monitored 24 months out of the year, 24 months out of the year, 12 months out of the year, and it's mostly storm related. And so um, July 4th and 5th, I was down on that crazy bridge taking samples, and it wasn't fun. But uh, again, very good data comes out of this program. Moving on to page two. Uh, that top one is the one that I just mentioned, that surface water assessment grant. Um, the ones below that, what's called Watershed Restoration Protection Strategies, or RAPS, I'm sure this is an acronym that you've started to hear as well. This is the, the latest planning effort from the state of Minnesota. Um, what happened is that, how to make this really short, not confusing for you. Um, the state of Minnesota decided to assess all of the watersheds it has in 10 years. And so it started back in 2007. This is the last year of the 10 years that it's doing it. And of course, the Redwood and the Cottonwood fall. We don't know how we got so lucky to be bring up the rear. But we're just starting that assessment. Um, all those prior watersheds that have done this, they've got this document. It shows you where the problems are, the, you know, the sub-watersheds. And um, it helps you get that grant funding to fix your problems. That's why we're having trouble getting grant funding specifically, is because we don't have that data. But we're, we're getting there. Um, but again, that surface water assessment grant for the first two years of that RAPS process, it's intensive water quality monitoring, and so that's what we're just finishing up this year. Then we will move into um, number two and three on your page, the watershed restoration protection strategies. We currently have a planning grant, which helps us pull together our, we call them our technical experts, so it's your environmental um, office people and the soil and water district people. That, you know, they know the watersheds, they know the problems that we have and we call them our local work group. So we pull them together and we're working with our consultant real closely um, to help identify this information and, and to get it going. Um, each of the watersheds, the Redwood and the Cottonwood, are gonna be getting a considerable amount of money to get this document done. We've hired Mike Associates to be the consultant to do this. We did have an RFP and went through an interview process. Um, each watershed is starting with $200,000 to start this process. In addition, over the next several fiscal years, we'll end up somewhere between 350 and 400,000 per watershed to get this effort done. Um, again, it does reimburse your county staff and your soil and water district staff for participating. Um, just again, it's that that's how important that technical information is to this effort. So that is what's going on. Um, the next one is the pesticide monitoring grant, Department of Ag. For over 30 years, Department of Ag in Minnesota has tested waters for pesticide residues, and they're up to now where they can test, I think, over 100 or detect over 100 different pesticides. Um, their program is actually one of the leading programs in the nation, which is really kind of neat to see. Um, they contract with area, two, or excuse me, RCRCA, and we've got four sites that we monitor. One is on Three Mile Creek. The other three are existing sites that we already monitor. Um, it's uh, Redwood Falls, or the Redwood River just outside of Redwood Falls, Sleepy Eye Creek, and then New Ulm here on the Cottonwood. So it's a, a good, easy um, process for us to do. And they, they pay well. They reimburse you very well for your time and effort put into that. Discovery Farms Minnesota, that is our, our latest endeavor. Uh, this is year two of that new project that's in the middle of Redwood County, just uh, four miles north of Obasso. Um, Discovery Farms, it, there's a link there. If you don't know much about it, it's, it's really pretty interesting. It's actually field scale data that a lot of farmers have more faith in. You know, they, they have all the river monitoring stuff, and, and yeah, you kind of raise some questions and wonder how they're getting their numbers. 
the Discovery Farms, it is on site, measured off the, the tile lines and runoff off of the field that's being studied. And it's up to the date. Um, you can click on the, the TROST site, it's called, and it'll tell you how many how many uh, pulses are in that flume or have gone through the flume or the, how many times that tile sampler has run. I mean, so it's, it's real-time data, so it's really interesting. We're learning a lot from ourselves. Uh, the last one on the page on the Red River Turbidity Reduction Project, this was the last of the 319 grants that Minnesota had. Uh, we just finished up the end of June and submitted the final report last week. Um, we got 12 projects on the ground with about $150,000 worth of grant funds. Um, it was matched about 50-50 with $152,000, and it, it, was, it was a good project. Um, one more note on that Lake Redwood project. Um, again, I mentioned it's $7.3 million. The city of Redwood Falls has about $900,000 of match that they're putting towards that. So we're looking at you know, roughly what, $8.2 million for the project. Um, the project does fall under LCCMR oversight. So I've been busting my hump this week trying to get a work plan and budget and attachments ready by Friday. <laughs> they wanted very short notice. And then on September 13th, I get to go to the Twin Cities for a 10-minute presentation on my work plan, too. So uh, it's, a, it's a lot of oversight. Let's just put it that way. The last page, um, just a little bit about the administration of RCRCA. As you both know, Area 2 and RCRCA were co-located. We have the same office. Um, we share some services of our personnel, which works out very, very well. The eight member counties to RCRCA contribute $75,000 towards the budget. Um, like I said, even though we're grant driven, that, that $75,000 helps kind of fill the gaps where the grants don't or serve as match to those grants um, in the event that we do need that. Um, again, as staff, myself, I'm serving as executive director. Joy Bruns is our office manager. She does the bookkeeping and also the part time bookkeeping for Area 2. Um, Sean Manuka is our water quality specialist. He's the one you'll see out doing most of the sampling. And then Noel, Bill Molstead, again, another retired engineer that just can't quite walk away. He still <laughs> comes in and helps us as we need him. The levy for Brown County from for RCRCA is $10,050. Again, that too has not increased in, in the number of years. And then again, just another uh, reminder of our legislative gathering. Uh, you'll all receive invitations individually but just so you can say the date for your calendar now. I'm going to give a quick history to you know, a couple of our board members who are fairly new yet. Um, area 2 RCRCA cover basically the same area. We have we have nine counties in the RCRCA and eight in the in area two. So we have eight of the eight, eight of them duplicated. It's Lock and Barrow that's Lockerbar County is the additional one, and the, that's the additional watershed, also Lockerbar watershed. So we we basically cover the same area. And about six years ago, uh, Commissioner Lockter and kind of him and I talked a little bit, because I was on the RCRC and he was area two, and we talked about well, why don't we duplicate? You know, so we meet together because we were all going to meetings, and and that's where kind of I think the beginning of. of Merging some of the services and, and operations became part of it. And, and we worked through this, and we're at the point we're at now. It, it has proven to save us, I think, a significant amount of dollars by sharing an office. Marshall was the location we were at with Area 2. Redwood Falls was our, our office in, for the RCRC. We're co located in Marshall now. Um, it's, it's been a good fit. We have, um, in most cases, the same person serving on both boards. It, the board can uh, operation or management uh, from each county. It's a it's a uh, commissioner on the area two board from each county involved. On the RCRCA, it's a commissioner from each county, and a SWCD uh, board member serving also. So we have a much bigger board with RCRCA, but we duplicate on on the the county commissioners almost all the way across the board, and so. It saves counties money on per diem and mileage. It saves area two or CRC on, on operations because we uh, carry as serves on both, and we use the same uh, 
office manager on both. We do have a few of the other employees that are separated, but it's it's it just it's been a good, really good fit, and so it's it's been a very positive thing. And so, um, so I'm, I'm, I've had an opportunity to be involved with RCR since it started, and in area two probably about seven eight years ago I started with that one. Uh, so uh, a lot of a lot of history with them, and been very nice organization to work with from my standpoint. I've been, we, did, we do a lot of positive things. So, just wanted to share a little bit of history because I didn't know how much Tony and Dave knew about how what's happened and where we're at and how it happened. We, and we meet monthly. So, so uh, um, uh, I think I think we do a lot of things that that are envied by much of the state. The legislators, uh, at least our legislators, are very impressed by what happens. I can't say enough about they're quite proud of what we do. We, we, we are a little bit unique to the state. Um, we're one of those that's managed to do things in a way that we, we kept going. And some of these are, some organizations, organizations similarly started but didn't survive, but we, uh, we, we get you're received very well when you go down to the state legislature. We're always amazed at what we can get done in just a year with such a small staff. Just like that. that that's just screaming efficiency when you can have that kind of success rate. So that's good. Any other questions? I think so. Do we have a motion to so, I'll second it. And with the dollar amount, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Any other discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. All right. Thank you, Gary. Thank Carrie. you very much. Thank Thanks, Gary. All right. We'll take a quick break and we'll be back in five minutes. All right. We'll call a meeting back to order. Commander Melanie, welcome. Good morning. Oh. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you. Um, well, we're just here, as we talked about last December, we've come in here to just give you guys an update on the AIS prevention program. Activities maybe that have been completed so far and what are planned for the future. So with that, I'm going to let Amanda, who is handling all that, take over. So I guess I just wanted to check in and see if everyone's had a chance to look through some of the stuff that we've been doing since January. It's a pretty... Um, a row list, so I don't know if we need to go through point by point, but generally we've been doing a lot of outreach through various media via Facebook. Um, we did help to sponsor the Carol 11 commercial. I haven't seen it personally. I've, I've watched it on YouTube, but I haven't seen it on Carol 11. Um, so I don't know if anyone's seen it, but that was sponsored alongside uh, 12 other counties, so it's kind of a group effort. And then got some billboards up. Um, we also got some posters put up in some of the bait shops, so we ordered some extra ones, and those have been going up as well, so I'll leave this with John nicely, he can put up in his office, but yeah, so we've been doing a lot of outreach that way, and then also meeting with a lot of the lake managers, and folks who are like working at the landings more frequently, just to kind of see what their concerns might be, what they're sort of looking for, and how we can support them. In ensuring that we're not seeing a large influx of the AIS that we're trying to keep out of our waterways. Um, so I guess just wanted to see if there was any questions on that list first. How much uh, hands-on at the at the uh, landing have we done? We haven't. We haven't been focusing on hands on at the landings per se. We've been doing a lot of outreach with folks um, like the sportsmen's clubs, um, the kids groups, so we've gone to 4-H activities and done outreach that way, DNR. We went to Flanger and gave some presentations there. Um, we're not quite sure the peaks and flows, ebbs and flows of when people are actually going to be at landings. And so, if it's not being used, it's not the best use of anyone's time to sit there and wait. Um, but especially on DNR landings, you do have to go through this ambassador training, which I did about a month ago in order to be 
able to talk to people at their landings, and a large portion of landings in the county are run through the DMR. So that was something I made sure that we kind of went through as well. And I, I did, I, I have been talking the, uh, with some of the surrounding counties about their programs and what, when they use their people at the boat landings. And they say it's pretty, pretty hit and miss. Um, and it took them a couple years to kind of come up with a schedule, but it's, it's pretty sparse. They just kind of do the big weekends like Fourth of July. Right, I was just going to say, yeah. I think that it would be important to be there maybe on the big weekends, Fourth of July, mm -hmm. the Labor Day, the, you know, when there's a lot of yeah. both going in and out. And the other thing, you know, even just being at the landing mm -hmm. helps people <coughs> in a few times right. they talk with each other and they say yeah there was somebody at the landing mm -hmm. last week you know whatever so you maybe get more um, utilization and, and, and more mileage out of that than you think sure. just by the people that actually went through the landing that day I just I think it's important to have mm -hmm. some of that being right there yeah. so that people I've been trying to drum up a little interest from some of the like the sportsman clubs groups and the volunteer groups because I'd really like to see them get involved as volunteers to go to the landings um, because obviously we have a very small staff and so if we can get those folks in on some of these trainings, if we can get them out there and talking to people and going to the landings and volunteering their time, I think we'll get a, a bigger bang out of you know everyone's buck on that one. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of I've been trying to draw up that interest, definitely. Um, but it's something we've definitely talked about is, you know, let's do the first year and then maybe if we see the need to send, hire someone specifically at a job um, for time. And, and, and sometimes, you know, the, the people like the sportsmen and whatnot, they're aware of the issues right. they're, they're, and they want to do stuff to help do that mm -hmm. too. But it's the people who don't go fishing that often, you know, mm -hmm. that maybe, you know, two, three times a year or something and they're hopping around and they just aren't aware of those issues. And that's where somebody at the landing does make a difference, mm -hmm. I think, to, yep. to help them know sure. that a zebra mussel is the size of a pinhead, you know, <laughs> right. when it's born. So that's why it's so important you can't see them. Right. I mean, you're not gonna look in the tank and say, oh, oh gee, I'm there's zebra mussels in here. That's <laughs> so. Yep. Has the, the DNR, I'm assuming, has done something at Lake Hansker or somewhere, right? Or do we know that? For monitoring, right, have been there for a period of time watching, or do we Not know that? Not that I know of. Okay, that yeah, you know and that. I did speak with the lake association to see if they've ever done any kind of outreach, and they mostly say they put the docks in and make sure they right. stay on, and so it's kind of they're pretty a low key group. Um, so they weren't sure if they would have that volunteer base. So that is, you know, something that we're going to try to address. And I have spoken with the DNR specifically about when their crews are there you know, going to the landing and looking for anything that they might see while they're there because if they're there mowing or what have you. Um, and they've said that they do try to incorporate a little bit of that, but it's not their main job. Okay. Anything else? So upcoming activities, we're going to continue, we do a monthly radio spot and we make sure to include the AAS messaging as well as there is the 30 second, um, four 30 second commercials that go on and off. So we've got those going and then we've got the kids fishing tournament coming up here in August, a couple weeks, next week. Um, and then the environmental fair is coming up. Um, and continuing to meet with some folks and making sure that we're addressing their concerns. And I think that's the main point is continuing that outreach and education. Um, just letting people know that this is this is actually something that's available too. I think it's a big thing. I don't know that everyone knows that the SWCD is around and then probably don't know that we're housing the AIS funding. So I think that's good to let them know we're available. So the lake associations, have you, you talk with them, and are they, are there indications of wanting to cooperate and to to um, fund together to do some, um, you know, I'm sure it's not just uh, the species that we're talking uh, uh, weeds and and curly pond leaf and those mm -hmm. kinds of issues as well. So 
um, had had they mentioned any of that type of thing? Do, I think typically what happens is that the city, so like Sleepy Acre and stuff, they treated the lake for Coley Pond Beach. And so I think what typically happens is that the city puts together a proposal, goes to the sportsman's club and says, could you donate X amount of funding towards this project? And I think that they've worked together on that in the past. Um, I don't think that they have a large revenue. I know Lake Hansa does not. They don't collect mm -hmm. really dues or anything. So they don't have an active okay. participation. Clear Lake doesn't really have a lake in association. Sleepy Eye really doesn't. It's just kind of the sportsman club as the pseudo, you know, go-to people. So there's not a really well-established um, groups that way. So I think that's kind of some of the challenges that the mm -hmm. lakes are seeing is that they don't have the, this large volunteer base um, that's active. You know, sometimes people will send five bucks in for the pontoon tour or whatever, but it's not really they're not meeting monthly and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So no, that's I think that's been the challenge point. for them. Um, so I think they're leaning pretty hard on the cities to kind of take up the mantle and do some of this. So that's when I started reaching out to some of the city managers to say, OK, what are you doing with this? And so that's kind of, it's been a meandering path, trying to find, figure out who's doing what. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's not simple, I don't think. Um, and then DNR did not have any funding this year for treatments. So that was a big issue that there was any grant funding available. Um, so that might be something that they're turning more to us, I think, in the future, is that cities are going to be looking for this funding to help them. Uh, so I think that's something that maybe we need to talk about how, how much, if anything, would we be able to assist with. Um, so that'll be maybe something to think about here moving forward. I happen to be looking at the paper on one of your ads for the invasive species, and, and there's something in there. Well, and I don't know if it's if it's that, but in the fine print it talks about um, how to handle uh, bait, and there was something about disposing of worms on the ground is is illegal, or there was a way. Right. Uh, how are you supposed to handle worms? Supposed to put it in the trash can. Okay, not just on the ground. Not just on the but ground. But it says it's illegal to do that. That's or it's, it's part of the. I didn't make the law. It's so. part of the legislative. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I mean, this came directly that, from so. the DNR, so, yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, thank you. Appreciate your time this morning. And you know how to get in touch with us, so any questions, feel free to come back. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. 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 Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Stay well. Female. See. Yes. In a few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Karen, you're up. Okay, let's try to make it. Any other questions? 
See none. Those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Number 11. Number 11 is along the same line. This will help again um, for the new coming school year. We um, provide um, school health to Comfrey, Sleepy Eye, public and private, uh, Riverbend, New Ulm. And, um, we provide um, the, the school health service to the non-public and then to the public group we provide support services. Um, for their screening um, assessments that they have to do. And then in Springfield, we provide the school health for St. Rayfields. And then in Springfield, um, we also provide support for their um, vision and their screenings as well at the public school. So um, they're listed again. Um, the rate of $45 um, per hour is increased from last time, but that was approved in May by the board. Um, so we, again, the agreement. Um, was, was approved as well in May, and it just had a few minor adjustments, and the county attorney has reviewed them. I have noted how much those are on um, the RDA uh, and the attached appendix for them. So this is a fairly similar agreement. At the end, I've noted that with New Ulm, um, District 88, they actually go by um, exact numbers, and so sometime in December, I get actual enrollment numbers, and I can even come back to you if there has to be an adjustment made on each of the private non-public schools. I'll move this. Second. Motion to second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Number 12. Number 12 is participation in the New Brown County Leadership Program. And Kayla is joining me today. Um, she has expressed her interest in attending that. I think you're, most of you at least are familiar with that program. Um, several of our staff have been through it and they found it very, very beneficial to their career and to their um, leadership ability at our, in our department. Um, I've listed some of the um, categories that they talk about in leadership and then the, um, the brochure is online this year. So. There's not a paper one that I've seen, so a little bit different. Um, but we'd like to um, have Kayla attend this year as um, we get started this fall, and we have that budgeted. The, the people I've seen go through it have had very positive results, so I motion to approve that. I'll second it. Okay, motion a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. All right. Well, thank you. Okay, Ruth, you're up next. Number 13. Bits from um, Medica, Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, Health Partners, Alina, Aetna, Preferred One, and United Healthcare. Um, as you see in your attachments, um, Medica came in as our low bid. And so uh, we're requesting the board to accept the health insurance bid received from Medica and approve the premium rates for the 2019 Medica insurance plans. And these plans are the Medica 6650, 1330 deck that would be an HSA. Uh, single uh, amount would be premium amount would be five hundred sixty four dollars sixty two cents, and the family premium would be one thousand five hundred twenty four dollars thirty four cents. The Medica forty five hundred nine thousand deductible with an HSA single premium six hundred forty eight dollars ninety four cents, and family premium one thousand seven hundred fifty one dollars ninety eight cents. The Medica twenty seven hundred fifty four hundred with HSA, and that is what we consider our base plan. That single premium is seven hundred forty-seven dollars fourteen cents per month, and family is two thousand seventeen um, and ten cents per month. And the Medica low deductible plan is the three hundred six hundred um, single premium would be nine hundred seventeen dollars seventy-one cents, and the family is um, the premium would be two thousand seven hundred 
$2,477.90. Um, the payment of the county and share employee share will be according to the personnel um, policy and union contracts. Just to note, we did um, uh, drop the $500,000 um, request, or plan request um, for a proposal and added the, six, the higher deductible, $66,50, $13,30. Saw that the low deductibles, um, the, the participation was very low in those, so we decided that the 300 and 600 um, continue with offering that um, as a low deductible for um, just to be the 500 bucks. No, any questions? Can I keep you please let me finish your read here? Yes, sir. I noticed the trend, and this is for insurance reps here the, in a number of these it's gone down you know 14 15 10 percent what's what's going on in the industry that's causing it to go the other way now well for one of the things the claims experience became better this last year now so okay. when it went out for the bid uh, if we would have had the same claims experience going on right now as we did the year prior I would assume that we probably would have been looking at a, you know, 10, 15 percent increase over and above what the what the rates were at the present time. But since the claims experience now was was much better than the competitors wanted to uh, to get a part of piece of the pie here. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. I guess. Sure, if I could yeah. make a couple comments. Um, one, you know, there, we've received more bids than we've received in a long time, as far as I know. Uh, there were seven, seven uh, uh, contracts that were uh, bid. And so we got a very nice cross-section of what was out there. Um, the bids were opened and uh, very carefully reviewed by um, the county here as we open them to confirm benefit uh, discussion and what was there and what wasn't there. And uh, we did not allow any changes to uh, contracts or, or uh, companies uh, requesting uh, final offers or, or changes to things that they didn't uh, specify in the deviations of the one plan to the next, you know. Um, so that was, uh, Control to not to be fair and equitable. I mean, yeah, that, that's what we can do. <coughs> um, the plans, as far as um, coverage, the twenty-seven hundred is the is the base plan. But there was a special, and I'm trying to remember, and I can't off the top of my head know the the um, there's one of the forty-five hundred or the sixty-six fifty has a. Uh, contract. One of those two contracts has a prescription drug. Um, the 4500 would okay. now be considered a credible plan um, as uh, in regards to the me um, med Medicare requirements um, that for those who are age 65 and older, they would need to have uh, credible coverage um, for the prescriptions. Um, so they don't get penalized. So they don't get penalized. And now our, in the past, our 4500 was not a credible plan going forward um, this uh, for 2019 it is. so the 2700 and 4500 are credible as well as the low the 300. Yeah. and yeah well yes and uh, then there is a plan that has uh, some ACA um, maintenance prescription maintenance prescriptions covered in at hundred percent in the 4500 and that's in a 4500 plan mm -hmm. and so if we go ahead and approve this contract, I would want to make sure that that is um, relayed to the employees so that they make a, a, a good uh, choice. Of, uh, and, and to know that that's the only contract that has that, you know, in, in a 650 six, does not have that in it. So. I think in the committee, too, we talked about, you know, switching from health partners to Medico. There's some concerns that, you know, just making sure that. That was going to be seamless, and we felt that that was going to happen, and um, these companies have enough 
people in there to, to assist us and if there are questions or concerns. So we felt that, that was very minor, so we, we should move ahead with this, I guess. The committee felt anytime you can get a reduction in your premium, we need to take it. So. And we appreciate you coming down and uh, being able to put a face with the, you know, the company and the contract. And uh, um, we are assuming that you um, would help the support staff for Dwight. And Absolutely. We understand there will be a health fair on October 31st, so we will participate in that to educate employees on the plan as well as the value adds that Medica offers. And then is this with the open enrollment? Yes. I'll move to approve it. I'm going with Medica. And I will second that. I will abstain from this whole. Uh, okay. Any other questions or concerns? Any other discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, Mr. Enter, will you call the roll? Mr. Burr? Yes. Mr. Borkert? Uh, yes. Mr. Potter? Yes. Commissioner Winchettow, you're abstaining? Mm -hmm. And Commissioner Simpson? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate thank you. doing business. Yes, thank Thanks you. Thanks for coming up. We appreciate the business too. Thank you very much. Well, what should we? Go ahead, Ruth, and do yours, and then we can leave with. Should we do that? Okay. Is that okay? Unless you want me to come back. Well, let's let's move ahead. Okay. Number fifteen. Fifteen. Um, the next request is uh, to uh, for the board to consider the back the pack assigned points, um, and this would be effective January second, two thousand nineteen, um, through the rotational review process. And these would be for the assessor, or excuse me, the um, highway department um, positions. The county engineer um, was 24 and 34 points, and that new grade is a 22. The assistant county engineer, 380 points, um, new grade of uh, 20, 20, or excuse me, 19. <laughs> uh, the accountant, uh, 315 points, grade 15. The uh, accountant assistant, 211 points, grade 8. The Road and Bridge Safety and Construction Inspector, grade 25 points, um, grade 15. Do not press that button. The Engineering oh, Instrument Technician, 285 Don't. points, no. be grade 13. <laughs> the <laughs> Engineering A, 215 points, grade 8. Um, so these were pointed by PAC and asked the board um, to propose for rotation review. I'll make a motion to approve. And I'll second it. Okay, there's a motion and second for approval. Is there any discussion? I wanted to add, add that uh, I think with the accounting positions, and they had uh, a couple great jumps in there. But the change has been that they now deal with a lot of state uh, issues, uh, numbers that have to be reported to the state, and then that's all changed. So their jobs have taking on a lot more responsibility. That's why you see the extra jump there. I think, was there a change in the description too on that? And mm -hmm. the education. The requirements. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it, the um, nature of the work does, um, you know, does it look, need more of an accounting um, training of some sort, um, so a degree in accounting or financial management of some sort for the understanding of how um, the um, uh, the whole highway department accounting needs to be done, the cost accounting and everything else involved um, that they have to do. So it's a pretty detailed, um, the principles of accounting should be known in order to be able to function in that position. I think it's probably a table, but uh, the 
We've got eight in there. You have board action requested, and then it says the following assessor department positions. So, it should be highly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think overall there was there's more requirements for some of the positions there, and then there's there's some safety concerns and things like that. Yep, that certifications um, with other um, state required maybe federal too, I guess um, requirements of uh, the duties um, that they have to have certifications and so forth as well. So licenses. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Motion passes. Okay, 16. And this request is um, asking the board to approve the appointment of Lisa Krull as our full-time uh, full office support specialist, and that would be in the Human Services Department, effective August 16, 2018, and that hourly rate would be 14.6807. That's grade 7, step 2. Um, we are uh, will be doing a um, pre-employment screening since it's a human services um, position, and so we will. So her appointment is pending those successful uh, completion of those screenings. Good. Second. Motion. Second. Any other discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion passes. 17. Okay, and this request is to approve the appointment of Jeremy Reed as our full-time Sheriff's Department investigator, and that would be at the hourly rate of 33.8499, that's grade 17, step 18, and the effective date would be August 10, 2018, uh, and also approving um, vacation accrual starting at the five-year approval level, and then we are asking to um, authorize to post the vacancy that um, for the position he currently holds as an intermittent part-time Deputy Sheriff Court Security, uh, according to the policy. I'll move. I'll second it. The motion is second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. 18. And this request is to accept the resignation of Brody's old store as a full time correctional officer, and that would be effective July 25th, 2018. And we're asking the board to ratify the posting for the vacancy of a full-time correctional officer according to the policy and contract um, with the resignation um, and the board meeting um, a couple of weeks later we um, wanted to get that position out there so we could get some candidates in and did that filled as soon as possible move it second motion a second any other discussion <laughs> seeing none those in favor say aye Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. 19. And this request is to approve the appointment of Barbara Christensen as a full-time social worker, physical and mental health facilities at the bachelor's level, social worker position, hourly rate of 30.2443. That's grade 14, step 24, with the anticipated start date of August 31st, 2018. And uh, of course, that would be pending her successful completion of pre-employment screenings um, due to it being a uh, uh, Department of um, Human Services position. And then also um, requesting to start her vacation approval at the five-year approval level as well. Mr. Chairman, just a quick note. Um, it, through the interview process and the acceptance, we're glad to have Barb Christensen back because she actually did this work for Brown County for close to 20 years. Went to Nicola County, did the same work as a supervisor for a number of years. Actually, is currently employed by the state of Minnesota DHS as a supervisor in this area, and she wants to come back home. So uh, uh, that's why there's a there's a high level of step here, and uh, she's coming back. I'll move it. Second. Okay, motion a second. Any other discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. 21A. And this request is to approve the appointment of Kristen Morrison as a full time social worker, the family facilitator position, and that would be at the hourly rate of 22.1340. That's grade 14 entry level. Anticipated start date would be August 20th, 2018, pending successful completion of the um, pre employment screening as well. I'll move it. 
Back on it. Motion second. Any other discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. There will be. And um, this request is for the board to approve the resignation um, of Diane Dunn as the full time appraiser in the assessor's office and approve the appointment of Diane Dunn as the full time deputy assessor at the hourly rate of 23.3707. That's grade 15, entry level. The start date would be tomorrow, August 8th, um, 2018. And um, being that she's our current uh, appraiser in that department, we're asking to post for that position now um, due to the her moving to um, transferring into the, um, into the other position. And so we would post it according to policy then. Move it. I'll second it. Motion a second. Any other discussion? Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. All right, thank you, Ruth. Could you see if Lane is out? Oh, yeah. there? Sounds like we could keep the door open. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Um, do you want to move to 20? Commissioner Potter, did you want to move to Oh, sure. Uh, this is the... Uh, Time we make a decision on, we've talked about the PACE issue, which is the property assessed clean energy program. Um, we've, we've had, I think, four of us had a presentation at district meeting. Um, I did a little more research on information. Uh, Brown County has not had a project in it by the PACE program. This is through the Rural Clean Energy or the Rural Energy Board. Uh, this will not affect our membership on Board Rural Energy Board. This is separate, it's combined by a separate process. So anyway, uh, this is based on just this process, whether we're interested in, in uh, putting money forward to keep that program working, uh, at least from Brown County standpoint. So we haven't had any, any projects in the county. They have done a couple of energy assessments in Comfrey. But uh, the individuals who uh, went through the energy audit uh, decided to do the process through one of the local better, uh, develop uh, uh, EDAs over there or, or some place like that. And so uh, that was how that was handled. We do have the option to do this. To, we could fund this project on our own through the county and run it through our partners program. That's a, another possibility, or we can just um, not have it available in, in Brown County. Um, to me, it's a lot of money for us not um, having any activity in it. And that the, the, the dollars they're asking for are dollars that will uh, operate the administrative part of it, because when this grant was started, there was, it was not set up to have administrative dollars come out of there. So there's nothing for, for operating this uh, program for the people working with the PACE program. It's, it's run through the Southwest Initiative Foundation in Slayton. Yeah, and we got questions. I'm, I'm, it's not something that we've had any, I've had any experience working here with. We've had, we talk about it in our meetings, but uh, uh, some counties have, are fairly active in it. Uh, I think the two active, most active, I think are Jackson and Cottonwood counties. Okay. It does a lot of things that, if, for those of, I don't know if anybody remembers when we did the energy audit, with the courthouse or the county buildings. Uh, I don't know if I'm going, how far I'm going back with that. Whether there's anybody was on there at that point in time. We did the energy audit and we and a company came in. Most of it's lighting. You know, it tells you how, whatever you do for energy, with the energy audit, how long you would do, uh, take to get a re, re pay your, your cost of your, your uh, improvements. Done. So we went through that with we did the lighting here. 
a similar type of, of issue. So uh, if this one is available to agriculture where uh, times economic development does not include agriculture. But it's, uh, I, th I think this is through the USDA, if I remember that part of it. I personally really have uh, difficult times to put the six, the, the dollars involved. Uh, as at the Energy Board, we talked about this. Most of the counties that did not have activity within them or very low activity were questioning whether they would support uh, the, the, organism, the continuation of it. We have question. We haven't contributed money to this. In the past. No, this has been run. This is first. Time. If this program is going to continue, there needs to be an ongoing. And this would not be uh, just a one-time thing. This would be an ongoing process to keep this going because, again, they when they started it, they didn't put dollars in to administrate the, the project. So we're having to do those locally, and <coughs> it's going to kind of doom the process if. They don't get some kind of funding for that. Uh, they, those counties are going are, are, are to have to work something out to get it done. Yeah. Mr. Chair, the uh, dollar amount, as Commissioner Potter stated, you know, 6336 that's a, and that is not going to get smaller, and it's not going to go away. And without any projects here, I, I've looked into this PACE program somewhat, and, you know, it does have some, some good qualities to it, but... But um, it's all dependent upon the um, business to want to make improvements to their energy efficiency. And you know, if it's large enough, the, then they could uh, take a loan and pay it back through their cost savings, supposedly. Um, that's not always going to work in every case, obviously, either. So uh, I, I think I agree with Commissioner Potter. You know, it's a another avenue, but it also has a cost tag uh, associated with it that um, I don't know that uh, that's an efficient use of our levy dollars, so. That, that was my struggle with it, was, it was just, we're, we're paying for things that at least we're not using in Brown County at the time. If we, if we had usage of it, it probably would, would drift definitely change your, deal. your perspective on how you look at it. I understand the concept of it, but I think if you look at our large agribusinesses, they're they're doing this stuff already. They understand the advantages of put, putting in LED lighting, and they're updating stuff as fast as they can. And, and I think large businesses are doing the same thing. So they, they understand it, and um, the organization provides some numbers, and it's nice to see that. But I think a lot of this is being done already. So. So I don't know if we need to, I guess, if we're not going to entertain the motion, do we need a motion of some type to? We did get the request from the Energy Board for this appropriation. If the Board doesn't favor that, we should state that by motion and put it on record so we can notify the Board. So I'll move to um, not uh, fund or uh, join the Rural Energy Board's PACE program. I'll second it. At this time. I wouldn't think that down the road that uh, you wanted to get in later. You, I mean, yeah. it might be a bigger buy-in, but... Yeah. I'm not sure how they're going to do this. They were trying to find ways to bail out. The, the problem goes back to about five years ago or so. I don't know whenever it started. They just didn't set it up <coughs> in a way that they could fund the local cost of operating the program. I mean, it takes, you, you, people don't find out about these programs just because it's sitting in an office and you can go in and do it. You have to go out and promote, and that takes staff time, and it takes staff time to administrate. But I, we didn't, at least I didn't see it at the time. I don't think everybody understood it, that there was not dollars for administration. I mean, if you, I think we've all sat here long enough to know that most grants come through with a percentage of it as some kind of administrative 
dollars involved so that you can operate the program and it's not locally, it's not a local cost that way. So I, I, that's where I was concerned about and that's why they're in the, in the point of being in a financial problem. Okay, a motion, a second, any other discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, Lane. Good morning. Good morning, Lane. Good morning. Good morning. Um, our landfill permit that we now recently received allows us to apply untreated leachate only to the existing spaces. Um, we produce about 1.3 million gallons of leachate per year out of the land. Um, our current spray field can only handle about a million gallons due to the fact that we've um, constructed or started the construction of cell 20, which is going to eat up a sizable portion of that. Um, so our, our, our alternative is to haul the leachate to the Nuam Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, the new spray field uh, to the north needs to have background work, um, i.e. Um, monitoring wells put in. We have to do some testing. That's going to be done next year. Um, this contract will allow us to get rid of approximately three to 400,000 gallons of leachate. Um, <clears throat> the uh, leachate will be delivered to the um, list station uh, at 1917 South it's near where the uh, shells were housed. Uh, um, the contract um, was looked over by um, our county attorney and also the, the city attorney that they utilized for, for the PUC. Um, the um, total disposal fee is going to be about $20,000. That's just to get rid of the green beach. The um, hauling has yet to be determined. So, so this is dependent on our. We still have to make up the proposal for the leachate plan, correct? And it's this isn't this isn't necessarily going to happen. It's really dependent on the plan moving forward, and I mean, it's a, it's a possibility or it's part of the plan, possibly. The leachate management plan has been submitted to the state. Yep. The, um, this contract is dependent upon how much leachate is produced. Okay. You know, if we only produce approximately a million gallons, then we can get rid of it on the spray field. We don't have well, little or no hauling if we have a, you know, million and a half gallons that is produced, um, we won't, or we will have to haul that possibly half a million gallons. Um, once the um, liner has been installed, um, we're, we're going to be treating that as, as uh, stormwater up until we put garbage on it. So, um, that Once we put garbage on it, then it's going to be leachate, and then we're going to be getting more water collected. So, but it's still, the state has not, they have the plan, but they haven't accepted or that has not they been resolved. They haven't acted on it. Yeah. So. The additional spray field. The additional spray field. Yeah. Okay. That, that was one of the questions I was going to ask. It, will we, will, was there potential we could still use that additional, the new spray field? The new the spray future? field will, can only be used after we do this background okay. testing. Yeah. Then we have having the well dug and... and that's, that'll be determined next year. Correct. Two other questions then. Any idea what it will, you didn't, this doesn't include hauling. Any indication of what hauling? Um, I am not received any quotes. Um, we haven't walked to the store yet. 
Okay, then the other question is, is will we be able to recycle some of the leachate back into the plant, do garbage of the new plant uh, cell uh, uh, at some point? Once we get, I believe it's 20 feet of garbage on that, then we can start the process of. of and do you have any idea how much we'll be able to recycle that way? We'll, we'll uh, it's not going to be very much in the beginning. Okay. Otherwise, the, the garbage gets too wet. And in time, it, in time, then there is the possibility that we may not be having to be hauling possibly if we can get the, the other spray field going or if we can recycle enough leachate into that, that may help us to resolve right. so that we're, we reduce that on the, this cost. The demonstration and research project that we are proposing to do um, next year uh, will determine whether we can get the leachate clean enough where we can apply it to the new area to the it's uh, unless we get more surprises. Unless we get more surprises. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. If have we talked to the EPA at the federal level on this at all yet? No. Okay. Uh, is there a reason for that? Um uh, had lots of stuff going on in our office and Okay. I would like to make sure that we do contact them. Okay. And um you know, possibly we could get some help out of that, and and uh, this is going to be a terribly expensive proposition. Um, we start trucking at five thousand gallons of truckload, um, in addition to the twenty thousand this year. If we have to do a million three, and you got sixty-five thousand for the leachate plus the the trucking would be. I don't know what the final result would have on our landfill, if that's going to be something that would even be feasible to distribute the uh, cost of that and be a uh, opera. We, <clears throat> our permit will allow, allow us to put untreated leachate on our existing spray field um, up until 2021. And it's the treated leachate that we come up with, and we still need the parameters from the MPCA. Once that is cleaned up, we will apply it to the North Spray Field after we have a, uh, a background work done. Well, I think it's important that the, when I talked to the EPA, they <coughs> suggested to call them and that. Uh, you know, there's other, uh, get a little background information before we make a call to make sure that they're aware of how many counties this is affecting in Minnesota. And, uh, you know, we're not the only ones being affected by it. Um, it just, it's a very expensive proposition here that we're, that we're looking at. And uh, I would like to make sure we investigate all the possibilities there for to me, the, the frustration part of it is that uh, my understanding is dilution is the process they use. That's still to process the leachate or the part of the leachate that we have to call, or will they run it through the wastewater treatment plant? It'll run through the wastewater treatment plant, but the constituents that we are getting hit on, the perfluorocarbons, they can't take them off. Um, that doesn't get removed by the wastewater treatment. Yeah, honestly, too, it's highly frustrating. It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, if, if they can't remove it, then I, I'm not sure what we're hauling up there. So. But I understand the legality of it. Yes? Are, this is a, maybe it's been brought up before. Are, are they treating the different wells in your plan? Is it are they being treated differently because of the PFCs might be worse in one than another? That from where you draw, you'd be able to apply how many how many different source points do you have again that you pull the leachate out of? 
Um, I mean the old system, not with the new one that's going to be coming. Source points mean like the whole. Where you pull the leachate from? It, the the leachate comes from the lined area okay. of the landfill, which but is basically the new, the new generation landfill. Right, so but it doesn't all. But we also have the sumps in some of the old area. Sure. Are, yeah. are we still pumping that and including that in the leachate pond? Yes. So like it's pumped up to the leachate pond? That's not that much. Well, it isn't much. Okay. So but basically, that, it, it's, it's just one, one area that pulls in or collects in from two, yeah. two ponds outside, outside of those other ones. We have two ponds, yes. Okay. There was, there was a, a difference in the VFCs <coughs> from one to the other. We have it? not tested the leachate on either um, the old stuff. But Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Berg, I think that's a valid point. We do need to check that leachate in the old area because that's a whole different filling history than what we have in the new generation area. If that's a concentrated issue, we need to know that from those old area sumps. Isn't that part of what, uh, is it I use, I don't mind, but yeah. 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 GI was, was going to, I mean, there's some options there on how, how this plan moves forward and that. I'm assuming with, with the perimeter tiles and, and the different wells that we have out there, this, how we mix and match and some of that, there's there's options there of how we go There may be this. some of that. So, yeah, I, I think that was part of what the engineer was, was looking at. We don't have choices here, really, do we? I mean, it's, this is this oh, or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so, this, <laughs> this or out of business. Yeah. Much as I uh, wish we had another option, uh, I, I guess this is what we have to do to continue, so I'll move to approve this because I don't see us having another option. I'll second it. I think it would be good to talk to the federal people on this. I don't really think that the state, this is new ground for the state also. So, I mean, if there's some ideas from the federal government or, I don't know, information that we can find out, maybe not. But I think it's worth calling and seeing what they know. So. Well, sometimes it's just education, whatever, too, and it's yeah. to, to know that the point of Commissioner Potter stated this before, you know, this chemical is still being produced and still being uh, sent out there. Uh, how does that make any sense? It, it doesn't. I, you know, we've got to quit producing it if we can't get rid of it. So they need to be sometimes made aware of those issues as well. They're making us pay the penalty for what they're not doing. Right. Right. We're the ones paying the penalty. Yeah. But I, I think you're, have other, have there, in the meantime, have been any other landfills that have developed a positive or, or in the same situation we are because of this? Not to my knowledge. Um, we got lucky, huh? We were the first in the state and we're kind of the, the guinea pig, the test balloon or as you know. Why couldn't we got lucky and bought a lottery ticket instead of a landfill ticket? Um, I, I have been in communication with other solid waste officers and um, nobody that I've talked to has received a hit in their leachate as high as what we have. Um, so that's why the state is coming down on us. And um, that's, but it's coming. It's other states have um, started acting on the um, PFC PFAS problem, and we uh, Minnesota's kind of late in the game, but um, it's it's going to be more of an issue in years to come. Well, and that's why as. Commissioner Simonson stated that you know we, we need to test these areas that it's coming from to, to 
determine if we've got an area maybe where we have extreme concentration that is, you know, a small flow of, of whatever, well then trucking that away wouldn't be a big issue. So we really need to have those tests done in order to do that. Um, and again, just to, you know, the EPA, when it, that, that card, the contact that I gave you when you have, uh, is a very pleasant person and was very, uh, you know, confirmed that we were working with Minnesota Pollution Control and that she was interested in hearing from us, so. Okay, okay we have a motion to second on this contract. Any other discussion? Seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. <coughs> okay, uh, we are down to your business. C1 is a minutes from July 24th. C2 is AMC information. Annual award nominations, if you want to participate in that. C3, County Program Aid for 2019. And Commissioner, uh, if you go to the, the first page is the, the law change in the county need aid. It actually was a small reduction over all of the dollars available. And on page uh, two of four, is the equalization aid formula. Page three of four, Brown County's aid is going down about 26,000 for 2019. What we did on this chart on 2019, you see the numbers at the far right is what's certified for next year. Uh, on the far left uh, is what the counties received in 2018 for your, your information. I thought I saw in here, Administrator Energy, um, it said it would not go down. Earlier on here, I thought I had highlighted it, but maybe I didn't highlight it here. Let me see if I can find it. Well, if, if you look um, at page four of four, at the far, uh, the last page, at the far right, the 2019 county program aid available to counties is 233958000 At the far left, uh, in 2018, it's 234 million ninety thousand, so it's down 130 thousand dollars statewide. So it's a minimum overall reduction. I'm not sure why that happened. Um, so base, basically, it's the same dollar amount overall, but then they apply the formula, and we lose twenty six thousand dollars through the formula. first page of 2017 law changes and it says the in, this in, indexed value is rounded to the nearest ten dollars it cannot be lower than the previous year is that what you were yes yeah, that's, that's it the index value is rounded to the nearest ten dollars and cannot be lower than the previous year could we get some clarification of what that's supposed to be The index value might not be the value that they're actually providing, so it's something that's based on, which could give you a lesser dollar amount, but, and I wonder if that's what happened. Right? And we'll review this further in our budget meetings, but the message has been, if you go back 10 years ago, 6% of our budget was funded by county program aid. Now it's less than 3%. So it's a continuing caution. Okay. okay. The last last year we got a, an increase. What about the last two or three years? We've got a little bit of a last year there was an increase. Uh, last couple years there have been. And with this new formula, the small counties, which uh, 
had a large increase because they lost a lot of county program aid because the farm values went up dramatically. That's been restored for, especially you go to southwest Minnesota, a lot of those counties now are getting aid like they did a number of years ago because they were down to virtually nothing because of farmland values. So the formula increase, the increased dollars and the formula change helped many rural counties, small counties, uh, but then each year it depends upon this formula application by the state as to their actual dollars. Okay. All right, C4 is Bridging Brown County. Their annual fundraiser in Sleepy Eye in October. Information on that. And C5 would be the fall policy conference we got handed out to us earlier. Do, do commissioners know who's planning on attending so we can make reservations and registrations? Um, I'm not, I've got plans out of state at that time, so I'm not going to be going. I will, I have went the last two or three years. Um, it is a good, it's two days well spent because you do get to work on policy. Much more time is spent there because if you're doing the preliminary stuff on policy now for the state meeting in December, um, it is excellent place to network with other commissioners. You get to deal with, you get to meet with other commissioners and you go over things. You, you to me, it's it's worthwhile. Um, it's back in Alexandria, which is a much shorter drive than it was last year. Um, last year I decided to go to this and I didn't look close enough at where they were having it. And I found out after we left, I assumed it was back in Alexandria. So I drove up to Alexandria and got there and went, oh, it's in Breezy Point. I got two more hours to drive to get there. <laughs> so my wife and I had a, a rather Experienced adventure that evening, driving to the last two hours to try to get from Alexandria to there. But it, uh, nice facilities up there. They they do a nice job. I would encourage you if you can get a way to go. Uh, it's just good. Uh, it's good for learning what AMC is like and what what that uh, that particular uh, part of the the uh, organization is can do. It's an important part. We, I think policy is getting more important because I'm serious to look at this in my 12 years legislators, our state legislators are getting further away from us. They don't understand what's going on back here in our counties and we need to work to try to keep them aware of it. Now you don't meet, they don't come up there to that meeting, but we do work on policy. Do we have any uh, known uh, commitments here to attend. If if not, whenever you know, let us know and we'll make the reservations. I'd like to go with the kids. Okay. I went last year. I thought it was very good. I have a conflict of other county business, so I wouldn't be able to attend. Okay. I have conflicts too. I'm not going to be able to do this year. Okay, we can let Chuck find out. So. We'll wait to hear from Commissioner Berg. Well, I might be able to. I was just going to check my calendar here. And, and we don't have to register today. Just let us know. All right. Okay, that is it. Correspondence. We'll go on to committee reports. Um, did you want to grab Pam and Barry back? Or did you just, I think she wanted to introduce. Well, she was yeah. just asking if you guys approved that oh. appointment. Okay. And I said, yeah, so then she left. If, if, if she wanted to come back, that's fine. Okay. We'll go to committee reports. Okay, Mr. Chair, I had a South Central EMS meeting on July 26th at 115 Eagle Lake. And it was, um, <clears throat> it was a pretty productive meeting. We had, um, just to address that $5,000 allocation when we had Mark Griffin here um, giving us a presentation a little while back. We had talked about it. Um, the state 
money's just not coming in. Again, a big part of that is seat belt. And we're just not, we're not seeing there. And I, I think that there's several factors involved with it. Um, one thing is seat belts just are being used more. Um, the other thing is they, they say that just enforcement in general, especially in the metro area, there's, there's less traffic enforcement than just the general cycle right now. So anyway, um, we're at the point where if we don't do something and you know we have a statutory requirement to provide this, we actually had the commissioner down um, for, for the state. And what they'll do is, you know, we, they allocate so many, much funds. Of course, with the seatbelt, they simply don't know from year to year. It changes month to month. They, they give a projection and it always comes in lower. So, you know, we'll actually go through the auditing function or we'll go through the function where we ask for funds and then they're like, okay, this is approved, that isn't approved. But bottom line is they never give us the amount of money that we're asking for that, you know, technically we'd be justified having if they had funding available. So we just simply, they just don't give it to us and that's the end of it. So, and uh, you know, this guy had <coughs> some suggestions, um, you know, it all pretty much involves kind of what we're already doing, the counties um, doing some type of contribution, they're looking at other type of fundraising activities, but I mean, I I, I had shared that I, I have a hard time with doing any type of fundraising, having our staff do things like that when their whole mission is to, you know, provide this, this service, so. I think that's something that we're going to have to address at the legislative level, talking with our senators and representatives from the state. Um, also, we talked about strategic planning. Um, you know, that's something. There is one area that we've been having these these strategic planning um, initiative meetings, and I'm I'm on that subcommittee, and. Eric Weller has been kind of our lead on that. He's a really good leader. He has this real solid background. And what we've done is we've done surveys from everybody, from all the all the counties, from from basically people that work in the field. And they've had um, they did it for ambulance services. They did it for first responder rescue squads. They've done it for um, law enforcement and then regional EMS programs. And they've just asked, you know, what what's your views, what, what's effective, what could we maybe get rid of, maybe other even areas, what, you know, cost-effective programs that we could, could uh, add to our, our service. And, you know, we're, that's still work in action, but we're really looking at, you know, we're gonna have to focus on cutting maybe some, some programs. If there's something that we're providing that's only serving a certain amount of people, like David talked about the rehab. I think that's really important just for a refreshment. That rehab program is like when they actually go out, so let's say we're fighting a fire for one of our, or a few of our fire departments for, you know, 24 hours or whatever the period of time is. And they actually go out, they assess, they're making sure that the firefighters aren't overdoing it. They're actually taking their blood pressure, they're making sure they're hydrated. So they're basically like the first responders for the first responders in a sense. Um, that is maybe something that instead of us driving out there, it's something that they could train other services to do. Um, one big thing that this commissioner had brought up, the state commissioner, is that when they, everything gets audited, all the funds that they, they provide us, we're really disproportionately high with mileage. So we spend a lot more than any other region in the state of Minnesota. And all the regions are having the same problem. Seatbelt money's down, but it looks like financially we're the most strapped. We have less money actually in the bank. And like I said, we're at the point we can't, we can't operate anymore. They're gonna have to do something because we have to pay staff or we're just not gonna be able to provide this. So, you know, there's definitely something we have to we have to look at doing differently. So it's not, not real great news. Um, 
but it just is what it is. And that would conclude my report unless there's questions. Otherwise, um, Region 5 Emergency Management Meeting, I went to that on August 1st at 9.30 a.m. in Marshall, and I went with Lynn Sletta and, and Roberts and Tella. And I'm involved with that. Um, I've been appointed to, to work with, uh, yeah. as far as that EMS readiness grant. Um, so what it basically is, and they had, at this meeting, they actually had our lobbyist down that's been working on that. And then um, also the lead emergency manager from Norman County had done the presentation at the, at the last uh, AMC conference. Um, anyway, <coughs> the grant, what this would be is it's $3 million for 87 counties and 11 tribes and um, four cities of the first class, which is like basically Minneapolis, St. Paul, Rochester, and Duluth. It equates to $30,000 for our county. Um, it, one, one interesting thing is it cannot be um, for supplanting, it can't be for replacement of um, the EMPG grant. It, it also can't be used for like, if we have something in place already, we can't use, you know, initially they said you can use this for whatever, whatever you would want to use it for. It's, it's your business, you just simply, um, basically $30,000 is awarded for, for that county. That's not exactly the case. So I, I, you know, that's something where I'd like to just have a little discussion because we're thinking of, we've had prior discussions about maybe having another um, emergency management director full time. I, I support that, I think there's a need. But if we can't use this money in the future for that, I, I would like to at least have all the options available. So I think that's at least something we should have a discussion on. Um, then um, the recommendations from, from the lobbyists is, you know, when, when we're going forward with this, we have to, you know, of course, have to be able to justify it um, to them, why, how this is a benefit to the constituents, the strength, and then, um, you know, having patience and being willing to kind of wait it out because it's not a, not a fast process. A lot of times there's a lot of hearings involved with it. But um, I think we're on the right, right path you know, it's $3 million from the state level isn't a lot of funds, so they're, they're cautiously optimistic that this will pass. And that would be about it for my report, unless there's questions on that. Okay. All I have is an act meeting, and it, uh, we went over it in the process today. We approved it. We just upgraded, upgraded a few in the highway department. Okay, South Country Health Alliance, uh, August 2nd, compliance and regular meeting. Um, compliance, um, they're going through making sure codes are up to date, uh, uh, that type of thing. Um, we got notification from CMS uh, of, the, of an upcoming audit, and this is the big one they kept saying, and that's, well, what does that exactly mean? And uh, normally you, you get one of these every three years, and we haven't had one since inception. So they knew what was coming, and just a matter of when they finally hit with it. Um, there's five areas that are audited. Um, they're on site for a minimum of one and a half weeks. Um, and then uh, weeks 10 to 21, they do uh, look at corrective action and uh, through weeks 24 through 48. So basically, it's just short of a year uh, of water. So uh, they're uh, feeling, we, they've done some practice ones ahead of time, uh, knowing that this would, would, would come eventually and um, really you know, feel okay. Uh, Every place they ever go to, though, does, they, they find something, okay? They're gonna find something. So 
they they do have uh, do expect that there will be some corrective action plans that will have to be drawn up and written up and that type of thing. But uh, anyway, that's that's uh, from the compliance side. Uh, they're one of their um, big um, things that are that are coming up here. Um, the um, they had a couple more power outages in the month of July. Um, still looking into uh, generators and systems there, and we kind of had a discussion as to why that hasn't happened, um, and that is going to be further considered and looked into. Um, the financial side here is pretty uh, bleak this time. Um, the current projection for 2019, uh, 2018, sorry. Um, I guess I don't know that I have an actual projection for 2018. We're currently oper at an operating loss of 9,681,000. Um, we started out good for the first two months and then it started going bad. Um, March, uh, we had uh, a net income of $980,000 loss, April, $3,400,000, May, $6,900,000, and June, $9,681,000 we're at. Um, they don't expect this to translate to double this amount by the end of the year. However, um, enrollment is about 2,000 less than anticipated. Mostly claims loss ratios have gone through the roof um, normally, you know, we expect to lose money on PMAP and, and Minnesota Care, uh, although we didn't expect that uh, with the increase in, uh, uh, I think it was PMAP was uh, like 17% uh, increase. But the current Minnesota Care loss ratio is 102%, PMAP is 100%, um, MSC Plus is 83, so that's a uh, you know, shining star there. Uh, single care is 102 percent, and shared care is for uh, 74 percent. So those are the uh, Minnesota programs, and then the senior care was 92.9. These are federal. Ability care was 113.5, and total federal uh, was 96.1 for for their loss ratios. So, and the loss ratios have been um, hit the hardest in the area of prescription drugs, and the new prescription drugs that are out are just you know really, really expensive. Um, I know that we had um, a couple of uh, prescriptions uh, uh, to the tune of $700,000 um, that, that, that will still be reoccurring. Now we do have, um, uh, we do have uh, loss ratio, when our, once our loss hits a certain level, there's an attachment point where we have reinsurance come in, um, that's at set at 200,000. So uh, there'll be some you know, reinsurance money coming back and that of course our reinsurer is gonna look at that next year again and they'll one say, you know, hold it down and look what happened here. So um, some, some real concerns there. The current, uh, as far as staff, uh, they're holding uh, no further staff. Vacated positions aren't being filled. They're, they're using, either they're not filling them or they're using temps if we have to have it. A person in that position. Um, they uh, did meet with DHS uh, about uh, these issues and the fact of the procurement issues that we've had. Um, Prime West also met with them and, and so as well as the other uh, uh, Itasca unit. Um, there were some um, legislators involved in the call, conference call, and uh, they did uh, to, to listen to what was going on. And um, as far as for passing legislation in order to get um, the procurement uh, process uh, straightened out, um, the state, the DHS said, well, it's a, it's a uh, state issue. I don't know why the federal government's being involved here at all. And of course we're saying that's because you tell us every time that we go to get it. Uh, there's a state legislative law that says that they do the procurement the way we want it to be done. 
but the DHS says, although there's a federal law that supersedes this, that over overrides this. And so now, while well, they had the federal people on the line, they're saying, well, this is a state issue, it's not a federal issue. Well, they said baloney, then why do you keep dragging this out and saying that it is a federal issue? So it didn't go real well, but um, they did have a conversation and some of the legislators were, had quit an eye opening into that. Um, Okay, so we're, with the um, current uh, payment, uh, we, we got through July. We always worry about July trying to make the payments and because the, the state withholds a percentage of our income back until, uh, well, they used to do it uh, in all these categories. From each one of those plans, they would hold it back 30 days. And this year, one of those plans was held back 60 days. Well, the truth of the matter is that costs us about $40,000 in interest, them holding that payment back. And all it's doing is buying the state more time to be able to uh, you know, make this payment. And the, this was a, again brought forward to the legislature as well. And there's a lot of them that aren't even aware that it happens. And they're like, well, how would we correct this? Well, you'd have to pay you make your payment on time, just like everybody else has to. But of course, that would cost them money, and they would have they've, they've gotten themselves between a rock and a hard place. Now, let's make matters even worse. Next year, they're going to require that all of the plans have a 60-day uh, lag time on it instead of 30. So they're just digging a hole deeper, and you know they don't understand what's happening when they do that, and. Uh, so when we talk to legislators, we got to uh, talk to them about the withholding that, that those payments and for, for those same time frames. It's, it's uh, not a good scenario. Um, budget setting, uh, uh, we talked about the RBC, uh, what's happening there, the, that the reserves that we have. Um, to see here someplace I have it written down okay so um, in 2016 our RBC was at 223 percent 2017 we had raised it to 255 and now in, at this point we're thinking that 2018 will finish out at about 152 uh, when it gets below 200 the state gets nervous and says they'd like to see uh, that RBC get back up above 200 but it sounds to me like they really it won't take action until it gets down to 100. And so we're keeping a close eye on that. We're going to have, you know, see what uh, what transpires there. Um, yeah, okay, net loss, uh, they're uh, projecting 2018 is 7.3 million. So they're hoping to have it come back uh, somewhat. Um, it, bright spots, investment income was up 300,000. Administration costs is 1.5 million below budget. Um, revenue is 2% below uh, budget though as well. Um, and the current loss ratio is at 97%, um, 94%, sorry, 94%. Um, we talked about the possibility of having to have a capital call, of having to uh, have the counties look at uh, contributing uh, something to this. Um, obviously, we know that's not a popular thing. We have had a capital call in the past. Um, the uh, If that happened, and we're just looking at here, they had done some estimations, and they estimated that if they needed 5.5 .5 million of additional capital, um, the they broke down the cost by per member per month type situation and uh, Brown County share of a $5.5 .5 million capital call would be 6.1% or about $334,965. Um, we, there are 11 counties and we are the third lowest county, the two counties that would be lesser than us and eight counties that would pay more than us. They aren't, saying they're going to be requiring a capital call, but they want us, because of budgeting time and whatnot now, to be aware of it, to be, uh, you know, know that it could be out there. Um, this thing is a roller coaster 
-hmm. all the time. And um, they are, of course, you know, in conversation with the, the people who set the dollar amounts and, and letting them see that, you know, this is not making money, that it's a, a you know, bad scenario. Um, just looking here, claims under 10,000, for example, um, in 2017, uh, it was like 710,000. In 2018, there was 431,000, or 431,000. Uh, so that almost cut in half. But the claims from 10 to 50,000 went from 1.18 million to 2.47 million. So almost doubled those larger claims. Um, uh, that was dollars, sorry, that was dollars. The claim amounts, uh, claim counts, but claim counts did the same thing. On the under 10,000 went from 2,300 down to 1,500, and from 10,000 to 5, 50,000 uh, went from 1,000 to 2,100. So uh, higher claims almost doubled, and that's part of what's, what's happening there. Um, That's pretty much it for now. We will certainly be keeping you updated as to the situation. And it would be kind of curious if I'm looking at this after 12 years. I've sat here longer than the rest, of them, except for Mr. Enter has listened to this longer than I have. But I think if we charted this over the, that time that I've been, and when Andy was doing it, it was we would just see a chart that went like this and year after year I mean it we get a couple of years that you get positive stuff and then it turns into we've heard the things about potential capital call it's happened once it's been talked about more way more than that uh, and I'm not downplaying it but it's in a very volatile scenario I, I I thought maybe they had finally figured out how to make it to make it flow a little better, but now it looks like we're going back to the, or whatever it is, this, I guess it's a valley here now. It's tough, Scott, I hear you. It's it's tough to go to those meetings and listen to what they had to say and makes you wonder what, what the future is. Yeah, it does, I, you know, there's no, no question about it, Tyler. And uh, I think after 12 years, I haven't figured out who's at fault for it. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, like I said, we, we talked about, you know, prescription drugs is the biggest outlayer that, that, that is what is really taking us down now, uh, comparatively, you know. But um, it is what it is, you know. Okay. Um, all I've got that we talked about PAC, Tony talked about that a little bit, Christian Berg. Um, the highway and we talked about that earlier in the insurance committee we basically talked about the improved the health insurance contracts so that was discussed also so that's all I've got so uh, I had area two RCRC and it wasn't much it was only an executive meeting uh, uh, this past week um, so we, we had a light schedule and uh, basically normal stuff going on. Uh, went to the Parks Commission meeting last evening. Uh, uh, interesting meeting. Uh, uh, talked about Frisbee Golf Course on Trummel Park. Um, had an individual there promoting it. Uh, bottom line is they're kind of closing nine holes, I think, and about three to four thousand dollars for the cost. Uh, um, it is apparently it appears there's a lot of leagues out there that are working um, as I sat and listened to it it kind of to me indicated and I asked the question I said uh, everybody pays to play golf you know isn't there some way you're working on something like this that at least you could be helping with the cost of doing these because I believe there's two go two frisbee golfs in Nolm. Springfield's got one, Sleepy's got one, Mountain Creek's got one, and if we go and do another one in 
and Tremel, that's a lot of them in the county. Uh, it, a lot of courses. Uh, it'll be coming. The, the, the county park commission's talk will just going over it now. We may discuss this. This may become something for us in the future. But um, I think there's a lot of questions to answer before we get to that point where we get to reality. Uh, talked about park, other parks, uh, Lake Hanska, a uh, new uh, person working there is working out well, so that's going uh, good. Uh, both both uh, everybody that uh, gave good reports on, uh, on his, uh, what's going on there. Uh, Mountain Creek, um, Lane talked about Seuscape. They have not operated it, the one we have fixed last year yet because of the high water. But they will be doing that, and they have procedure on how to make that work up and down a little bit. Um, and Area 2 did come out and look at the, the dam. Everything looked okay. We're, it looks like the, uh, the piezometer, is that piezometer readings at the lower end of, of the yeah, dam are, are uh, stationary. They, they were happy with those. There don't seem to be any leakage or any of that. So uh, I do know in a couple of the dams in that heavy rain. Uh, one of them up by Walnut Grove had water running over the spillway that after the heavy rain. Um, did cause the water running over there, not over the dam, but actually the water coming off of the spillway caused some issues because they weren't, it's not really expected that usually happen. So there were, but there weren't major issues, but it's just there. Some that did happen in a couple of them. Uh, Lane talked about the uh, canoe landing by Iberia and the one by the landfill. Um, particularly the one by Iberia has a lot of damage. Um, there's, um, I don't remember what he said, fairly deep holes in the, in the driveway. Um, Lane suggested that maybe it's time to Call it quits on that one, and so that was talked about, and I believe they voted to uh, recommend abandoning that that landing. So that uh, is something we may be looking at. Uh, Lake Anska, the camping is very busy there. They, they talked about the park being busy. Uh, Mound Creek, uh, an issue is beavers there, and they may be doing some uh, trapping. Um, on that is that part of it uh, was nothing really on lost dog that they brought up and the Tremel had the frisbee golf so that's kind of what they talked about it last night at the meeting um, then we got wet there <laughs> so we got wet well we were sitting in the shelter <coughs> and it started to rain lightly and I was fine we were sitting there and, and Chuck and I were sitting on the kind of the east side of the shelter and we were looking across the lake and <coughs> it's a little fuzzy, and I, I and it started to rain a little heavy, and I says, the lake's disappearing. Well, then the wind came up, and everybody's moved to the south in the center. And at that point, I, just before we moved, I told them, I says, I, when I drove up, I thought about driving the pickup up a lot closer to the shelter. <laughs> Wished I would have, because by the time I drove, ran from the sh shelter to my pickup, I was... Drenched because I, I, my wife was coming over from the mall, so we decided to have supper at a uh, place in town. And I actually went home and, and got a dry shirt on before I went out to eat last night. But a little shower came up real fast, and so uh, that's it for me. It's that horizontal rain that'll get you every time. There you go. How late did you stay to wait for it to quit raining? Uh, about 10 minutes. Was, was there a drainage committee? Oh, I don't know if you guys did the full agenda or... We did go through, and I didn't bring that along, we did go through part of it. Uh, there'll be some issues coming up. We talked about a couple of, uh, of uh, issues that we will need to address. Uh, nothing was serious, more of it was some things to kind of give direction to uh, Lane and, and Andrew about where to go. and. Uh, this, Water, I can't remember, I don't have the minutes right in front of me now, but most, but uh, there, there's a couple things going on, but there was nothing, seriously. That was a day that uh, we went a little long in the meeting and everybody had another place to go. Okay. 
Okay, well, if there's nothing else, we'll go to calendaring. Days of seven. Open. I have a salary meeting this afternoon. Uh, election uh, meeting following this meeting? Yeah. The election meeting and salary at two. Salary at two, I was just going to ask. I'm open. Seven. Okay, the eighth. Open. Public health meeting. Uh, joint LEC meeting, 1030. Uh, that's it. I'm open. I have fair the rest of the week. Okay, the ninth. Open. 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 I'm open. Tenth. Open. 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 I'm open, although I'm doing the farm family presentation on Friday at uh, 2.30 at the auction. Okay, the 13th. Open. Open. Brown County Historic Society, 7 o'clock. I've got, oh, I'm open that day. Open. 14th. 14th is open. Open. Mm, open. I've got SWCD in there. Planning and zoning. 15. Open. I have a JD 18 from Powers meeting and also a one watershed, one plant meeting. Three o'clock, uh, teen court celebrating uh, anniversary, third four quarters. I am open. I'm open. 16th. I have a ship meeting, 10 a.m. St. Peter. Open. Open. I have a USAC meeting that I'm unable to attend at 1, one o'clock. So I don't know if anybody. I can't be with that one that day. I guess let me know if you're able to do that. Okay, we'll move on to are you open for Chicago? Yes. Okay. And the seventeenth. Eight fifteen there's that election canvas meeting and then at nine AM there's a CHB. CHB. Uh eight fifteen canvas and or eight thirty canvas. 830 you said, right? I thought 815. I might have wrote it down wrong. I think it's it started out 815 and then 830. It, it's 830 for this one. It's 815 for the one in November. Yes. Yes. And 9 o'clock uh, community health. I'm unavailable that day. Okay. Community health. And, and, uh, and that canvas meeting's here. Okay, the 20th. Budget workshop. Budget. Budget. Same. Budget. And by the way, you got your books this morning. If there's any question prior to that Monday session, just let us know. It's same format, the narrative up front, and a, a lot of background with the departments. Okay. And the 21st puts us two weeks up. And on the 21st, Commissioner Borkard, Commissioner Simonson, at 8 o'clock, we have that uh, follow-up meeting with the county attorney on assistance yeah. salaries. That'll be in my office. And also, there was a request for a highway committee after the board meeting um, on railroad crossing discussion. So that would be Commissioners Berg and Potter. Well, I get fast action if I ask about what it. What day? 21st? <laughs> the 21st after the board meeting. I got it. 8 a.m. And, and actually, the building committee were tentatively looking at the 28th, but we'll review that at the next meeting relative to the license bureau. So that would be Commissioner Spurgeon and Simpson. Right. Did you say USAC was on the 16th or the 17th? 16th. The 16th, I can do the 17th, I can. Yeah, I think it's at 1 hour. I'll email you. Okay. I'll let you know for sure. And I'm, oh, Mr. Hunter, in reference to that EMC thing, I've got a Gabriel meeting that Friday. Okay. Is that at the uh, so Lindhouse? Yeah. So Lindhouse. Okay. Okay. 
So I think, is that it for Calvary? If there's nothing else, we'll adjourn the meeting. Thanks, everybody.